Um, hey, how are you? Uh, my name is Kenny Dutzvich, and I'm the founder of No Passport uh, with a core group of artists uh, some years ago. And so if you don't know who's talking to you, this is me. Uh, and uh, our next session is called Can You Cry on Cue? Uh, and it's being led by Patricia Angelin, uh, Alba Technique Master Teacher, in collaboration with Kevin, and I'm, I don't know how to say your last name. Uh, Shuring. Uh, who's an actor and a singer. Uh, I'm standing in for Randy Jenner, who is stuck on a train. Uh, um, and uh, so, so hopefully he will, he will uh, appear. <laughs> um, but uh, I want to graciously thank uh, Pat for coming on board and being part of No Passport 2016. And uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Karen Dye. Uh, Mr. Randy Jenner will no doubt be joining us as soon as the R train allows. Um, I see that we are definitely in New York City by the fact that we are all, almost all of us, a sea of black. Um, this to my right, gentlemen, is Kevin Schuring. Kevin is an equity actor and singer and excellent mover. <laughs> and is also involved um, very greatly in, in leadership and in um, and in bringing together communities. So we're very conscious of, of, the, of, of this wonderful conference and of dreaming the Americas and, and no passport. Um, when Randy arrives, um, he may break in or may not. He and I have created um, something, mainly him. You can de definitely tell that he was a um, senior editor of American Theater Magazine for many years. Um, he has created this beautiful class notes for us so that you can <coughs> Um, just you know, have a couple quotes and maybe just be able to stick with us for this um, half hour or 20 minutes or whatever we still have. And um, in addition to let you know, since we'll probably will have to cut things pretty short so that we can move on to the other wonderful things we're doing, um, I'm going to be hanging out at Panera Bread the day after tomorrow um, for about an hour, seriously, up in the balcony. Um, in case those of you who are local would have any further questions about this and want to know more about what we're talking about today. Uh, this is experiential. It's body. It's totally somatic. It's not a psychological technique. And we'll tell you a little bit about it now. So I am Patricia Angelin. I am a master teacher, certification level five, which is the highest certification possible in international Alba y Moting, which started in Chile. So this really is a dreaming of the Americas and a, oh goodness, a furthering of universal humanity through the emotions is what this is all about. And I think that we have Mr. Jenner here. Do you want to jump in, Randy, or do you want to sit for a moment and catch your breath? <laughs> Actually, all I'll say is... Uh, You'd have to, it, it's being live streamed, I'm Randy. Do, I'm, no, no, I'm just going to do what uh, Susanna Block said. We first met her in 1994 in Chicago. Can you please follow this with me? Come up here to do it, though, Randy. It's live stream. No, no, no. This is great. This is great. Please, come on. I can't see. So he's breathing, is what he's doing. He's breathing. Anyway, that's how she met Dr. Sasan Black. I did. I met her in Chicago many years ago. For theater and theater education. Okay. Thank you, Randy Jenner. Got it. Um, okay. So I want to thank you for coming here in the rain. <laughs> in New York, people tend to be stuck when it is uh, raining. We like not to go anywhere and to stay where we are. And we um, are at Alba Technique. Do you want to cry on cue? Now, do you want to cry on cue started out as an ironic blog post because people keep kept asking me since I'm dealing with universal human emotions. And even recently this came up, can you make me cry on cue? And my response was internally, well, yeah, if you've got the time, but do you want me to? Because so many scripts now with playwrights are saying breaks down in tears, you know, cries. And the directors are asking the actors to make sure that they can, boom, hit the mark and do it. And of course that instantly puts the poor actors into in the, in the state of, of fear naturally. So, um, so I'm dealing with human emotions. 
that is what I, I do. It is about emotions, it's about authentic emotion, real, in the body. So we're gonna just talk very quickly about kind of the what, the, um, the why, and, and the how. Going ahead, Kevin. Um, the originator of this, Doc, can you see around my head? Should I get out of the way? Okay. Um, is Dr. Susanna Bloch Arendt. She goes by Susanna Bloch. And we have just finished a um, revision of her Spanish language book, Al Alba de las Emociones. It is available on the Amazon for those of you who want to read Al Alba de las Emociones. And it's one of, it's kind of her seminal uh, Spanish language book. Most of her publishing has been done in Chile, in South America and the studies themselves originated in Chile. A lot of stuff comes out of Chile, and I think we're gonna be hearing more from Chile and Chileans as the world moves forward and, and becoming more and more global as Brandy Jenner's organization is in the culture of one world. And I think that's coming in, into fruition. Uh, Kevin has been doing a lot of work in this area as well. And um, Susanna Block is a neuropsychologist not a title we hear very much here in the United States. It means she's never practiced clinically. All of her uh, work has been research. It started out in Chile. She is an associate professor and in the School of Medicine at the University of Chile, and she is also an, um, a full professor in the Department of Neuropsychology. So what happened? was that they started doing research, not just on visual fields, for which she became famous with pigeons, but also behavioral motivations of animals, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, somebody in medical school said, would you do a human emotion uh, study? And then she said, sure. You know, I had hoped to become an actor when I was an undergraduate, but I realized that it wouldn't be healthy for me to become an actor because I wouldn't be able to handle my emotions. And knowing her very well, she was right. She wouldn't have been able to do that. But uh, it's a little bit ironic, therefore, that she's pulled together both sides of her sort of Janice-headed self uh, at this point, uh, because she started these studies in emotions with her colleagues. And of course, they, go ahead, um, they needed naive subjects. And they decided that the naive subjects would be actors. And that's how it came into the theater world, as actors. Because we are the next best thing to children. <laughs> and of course, you cannot ethically experiment on children. So, <laughs> so they, they decided they would use the actors. And, so the, and in the studies, the actors were used. And then they realized that this was really great stuff. And they wanted to be taught how to do it. So the studies you know, marched along starting in Chile, and then the, the latest studies were done at the Sunares in Paris, where Susana became the, um, the director of the research lab. She could set them up any way she jolly well pleased, and did, and the French were absolutely appalled. You know, quel horreur, Susana. You know, motions, emotions, messy, messy things. And you're going to lose your, your reputation. But anyway, so she marched ahead, and now we have what she calls Alba Emoti. So I would like you to take a look at the screen, if you will. I will get out of the way and just notice what you see from this kid. <laughs> Anybody else? Grief, terror. And the eyes come. 
Brief, brief terror, you said. Yeah, absolutely. What I, for our purposes right now, and of course, that's obvious, right? We were all able to see it. We were all able to feel it. Our mirror neurons started to go ourselves. It's very hard not to see that gorgeous little boy giggling away and not to want to start to laugh ourselves. And, um, but the most important thing for us in the theater, I think, is that the emotions did not overlap. The emotions, boom, 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 boom. As we become adults, I mean, very shortly after Emerson's age, as a matter of fact, <coughs> things start getting mixed up. We start getting wonderfully complicated. This is not a bad thing, obviously, but we lose touch with our core, our neurologically core emotions with the, the pure response to stimuli. So usually, you know, when you're little, it's, there is a stimulus, there is a response. And that is what we saw with Emerson. And it's true in the moment. What all the 20th century modalities were trying to get actors to be able to do, to really be able to hear and listen and be in the moment, that child had. So that's what we want. So there were absolutely no mix-ups. So to go back to the studies, the neural studies, what they discovered in their neural studies was that there are six core human emotions. Now this is a theory, of course, to which I obviously subscribe, but um, that theory is one among many. The ancient Hindus had 10. You know, they would put wonder as one of them. They would put, um, let me see, they're, they're, I can't think of, of the rasas right now. You've heard of rasa boxes. Um, using Hindu theory of emotion. And um, so Susanna has six. And they are anger, fear, joy, sadness, erotic love, and tender love. And she and her colleagues believe that these are the neurologically basic or standard human emotions uh, coming from the almost the most primitive part of our brain, coming from the limbic system. And I want you to look at another uh, piece of video here and see what you see in this video. It takes a minute to cue itself up. There's nothing you can do about it. This is from the, la uh, the late movie Inside Out. And they don't know we only have a half hour. <laughs> If we were on television, this, this would be dead air. Hands up, everybody, it's showtime. Ready? Ready. 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 And um, there was also disgust, which is not in Susanna Block's um, theory of emotions. Now, neurologists used to think that disgust was a core emotion. 
And you know, emotion, reactivity, um, it is now pretty universally held that disgust is, uh, is a reaction. And then the emotions that we have are in that less than a nanosecond thereafter we feel about it. In Susanna's universe, um, it would be uh, first fear, then anger. Boom, boom, you know, would be, would be discussed. And then whatever else one would feel about it. So there are the effector patterns are what this is really about. And the effector patterns are the patterns that uh, create the subjectively, subjectively felt emotion in the human person. And this is absolutely universal. It is the same in Belgium as in Borneo. Uh, so as far as our experience as actors and what we produce in the spectator, it's equally important. In Susanna's work, uh, they strove very hard to have ex the, uh, the, the naive observer's experience in, in, in identifying the emotions seen by the naive subjects to be of equal weight, which is very important for us in the theater. So what you feel in response to what I'm doing as a spectator is equal to what I am producing. And I think the most important thing that this particular, well, there's two really important things that this work does for the person engaging in it, whether an actor or perhaps a director trying to understand emotion or whatever. And, that, and one is that it, may, it puts us in contact with our core humanness in a way that no other work, I think, does that I have ever engaged in. And I didn't come to this until 1994. And um, I am a dame d'un certain age, as you can see. So I've been around the block a few times, and I had, and I had already done some useful work in the theater and a little bit of film and television, et cetera, et cetera, uh, before I even came to this in 1994. And it was just an absolute revelation. Not because it would replace in actor training anything, any of the other modalities that uh, that came out of Stanislavski in the United States, Adler and. Oh, Hagen, of course, and uh, Meisner, Strasberg, uh, et al., especially Chekhov. It's an excellent, excellent, excellent addition to Chekhov. Um, but it's an add-on. One of my students said, Pat, I think this is the final puzzle piece. So it's good for the individual because <coughs> it's know thyself, carved over that lintel and the Temple of Delphi going into that oracle. Know thyself. So this gives us a tool, a mechanism, to know the body as the body, if there's been nothing available until this that would enable us, empower us to know our bodies quite in this way emotionally. It strips down our complicated adult emotions to get back to the baby Emerson um, era emotions. So you know that and you know it somatically in your body and you're not in your head. It helps you get out of your head par excellence. So um, the effector patterns do that. And the effector patterns are comprised of breath, 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 as Randy alluded to when he came in, a postural change, a specific posture for each one of the emotions, and muscular tension shifts for each emotion, both large and small muscle groups, and facial muscle muscles as well. And so there is a specific very, very specific, like a cog going into a wheel. And you know when it clicks in because you feel it subjectively. Uh, and then one is said to induce in the emotion. Now initially this feels robotic because it is very, 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 very technical. Um, but as it sinks into the body, you just get to know yourself, all the complications <laughs> come in, and it frees, it frees the person. As a matter of fact, I, I was sought out by a a uh, speech therapist who came over on a Churchill grant last year from, from Oxford. And I went back and visited her in September and we we're going to do a study on the uses of ALBA technique in speech therapy. I'm going out in April to the uh, Mayo Clinic out in Rochester, Minnesota. So um, this is going to broaden out. You guys are really at the cutting edge of this right now in, in the Dreaming the Americas because not very many people know about this. And Kevin and a couple of other of my students have basically told me, Pat, you have to stop keeping this a secret. I initially wouldn't 
teach people that I hadn't already interviewed and this sort of thing, for a number of reasons. But it's, so it's very good for the human person. It is uh, absolutely universal. And it is simple, 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 simple. But it is not easy. Kind of like uh, T.S. Eliot said, quoting one of the mystics of the, I think, 14th century, a condition of complete simplicity costing not less than everything. <laughs> so it's something that get, needs to get into the body in order for the fullness of, of the freedom of it to come to the fore. So breath, posture, muscular tension, and um, let's just really very quickly I would like everybody to just take a, I'll tell you when. Everybody please just take a quick breath. Please take a quick breath now. Hold it. Internally assess. Let it out. Do it again. Quick breath. Now. Let it out. All right. Internally assess yourself. What are you feeling? Got to say it out loud. <laughs> Somebody does anyway. Circulation. Circulation. Okay, really good. Can you tell me what orifice you took the in breath in? Nose. You took it in your nose. What did you exhale through? What orifice? My nose. In your nose. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Everybody do nose. I did nose and mouth. You did in 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 through my nose, out through my mouth. Fab. Most people, if you tell them to take a breath, they take it in, they have no idea where they took it in, and they have no idea where they, where they let it out. And so this is a kind of an awareness thing. Now please come to the edges of your chairs. Now everybody here is in the theater, so everybody is trained to one degree or another. But let's heighten your own personal awareness. Feel the sits bones. There was a doctor sits, I believe. S-I-T-Z, sits bones. And look out on an imaginary horizon line right in front of you. <coughs> now please breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Please elongate the spine. Please release hands or feet or whatever you are observing might be a little tense. In through the nose, out through the mouth. Okay, good, good, at ease. Any changes, anybody felt any change from the way they breathed before when it was just cued suddenly? Uh, more from my diaphragm. More from your diaphragm as you were just doing this. Yes, anyone else? It's a more conscious breath. A more conscious breath, yes, yes. This is the beginning of a neutral breath. There is, a, in addition to the effector patterns, the breath, breath uh, specific breath change, specific postural change, specific muscular tension changes. The researchers noticed that when the actors got into the emotion of sadness, you know, one of the six emotions, and that was all quantified and graphed and blah, 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 like neuro researchers will do, they couldn't get out of it. There was an emotional hangover of this, which any actor knows is you know, very, very much present. And often we will be in, a, in an old-fashioned class and somebody's done a, a, a scene, say they've done a serious scene in, um, and it's just a one-on-one -on -one and it's an angry kind of scene. And then whatever the convention is in the class, they say, you know, scene or, or end or they bow or whatever it is that they do that's the convention. And then they stand there and maybe they'll shake out a little bit and, um, then, and then they'll list, be ready to listen to what the teacher or coach has to say in response to the work that they just did. So, but you will also notice that those actors, after it is said, say perhaps they'll even say, go to neutral. And so they will stand there and they'll be like, <coughs> I ask you, am I neutral? What am I? Agitation. Mm -hmm. 
Anything else? Tense. Tense. Anything else? I'm tense. I'm slightly agitated. I am so far from neutral. <laughs> so they had to decide uh, to find out a way to step out of the emotion. Now these were clinical situations, um, neuro research situations. So it's a definite protocol. And so she developed a specific step out protocol, which turns the blessed emotions off like a valve. It's absolutely fabulous. Now, of course, that doesn't do it in real life. It gives you an awareness in real life, but it doesn't, you don't want to turn your emotions off in real life. A lot of people say, can I control my emotions? Since mostly I've been teaching men, when they ask you, can you, you, can you control your emotions, <laughs> they usually mean, can I get rid of them? <laughs> and the answer is no, we don't want to get rid of our emotions. We want to be aware of them so that we can decide with our prefrontal cortex, with our executive brain functionings, what we're going to do with those emotions. My family is intact because I have done this work. <laughs> you know, um, I almost can't be drawn at this point into an anger reaction, <coughs> which is of course wildly useful. And I'm wondering whether it might be helpful for post-traumatic stress um, work for for people. You know, so eventually we'll be talking to psychiatrists and, uh, about that kind of thing. So. Um, we as actors need to know about the how. Let's continue and finish up. So we did that, and um, oh, let's listen to that. That's fun. Hey, Catherine, you're Alice, and I just want to call you because I'm so excited. I just had this audition, and I'm so excited to see that it was one of those auditions where like they did not cry in one of those things. And I've never been so available in my entire life. I just took a breath, and there it is. Like, I'm so freaking centered. That was after about her third class. So initially what it does is, you know, is it, it opens up the person and makes the person more available to herself or himself. And um, then as it gradually gets into the body and you know very, very clearly what your anger universally feels like. Uh, in what your fear, et cetera, et cetera. It just creates a tremendous emotional freedom uh, that there's just no other way to get. And um, so it's universal, it's specific. Eventually it becomes a tool. You put it in your toolbox, you, you box, you bring it out. Um, some people have asked me, you know, well, how can you reduce me to only six emotions? Well, if you know anything about pigments, there are only three basic colors. So we've got twice that. And so the color, it, it, it's light colors. Out of three basic pigment colors, uh, what is it, uh, red, 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 yellow, blue, we get the work of Picasso and Rembrandt and Brock and Degas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it doesn't reduce us as actors or as human beings. It enhances us. and. The Chileans were really on to something because the basic human emotions are basic to each one of us. They don't change. <coughs> we are absolutely individuals, as individual as Rembrandt's work from Michelangelo's work, and yet it's the same tools underlying it. So it's, it's wonderful, it's healthy, and I, I love doing it, I love teaching it. And uh, I think that that really is about it. Uh, Randy had a question. Oh yes, it's non-psychoanalytical. Yes, it, it's not a psychological. You do not think something in order to produce the emotion, because we know with the with the James Lang theory, William James and Carl Lange, all the way back to the 1880s. Uh, it's counterintuitive to us, though. We think that we think something and produce the emotion. That's very 19th and 20th century. What actually happens to us is we have the emotion and then we think about it. I mean, it, it absolutely is true. That is accepted neurologically now. But it's so counterintuitive to us as human beings. So yes, it's not psychoanalytical at all. Although, we do come to know ourselves. And that is, that is a, a patterning kind of an activity. But that comes after you feel the emotion in your body, and then you identify it after all. But it breaks all the labels. It breaks every label you've got of what you think your emotions are right now, doesn't it? Yeah. 
Do you have anything to say? Um, I would say uh, this uh, tool has basically connected the dots for a lot of things that I've learned over the years in many different uh, acting techniques. Um, it creates an awareness of yourself and other people that makes things like listening, all these, these basic uh, acting tools that we use, um, it sharpens them to the nth degree. And what it also is, is created for me is a, a world of endless possibilities when it comes to emotion. Because for me, I look at as painting kind of with emotion. Uh, like the emotions are very much like colors. And also, um, finding going back to the, the basic thing that uh, emotions are survival instincts. So nothing's really positive or negative upon them. Absolutely. Like we, we we put a connotation upon them, and uh, that's where kind of mixes come. So. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Yes, that's absolutely correct. We are naturally gifted and oriented to put things in labels and to put things in boxes. Uh, that's a, it's a, it's a human trait. So naturally, as we've gone through life, we have put labels upon our emotions. Oh, this is my sadness. Well, my sadness feels like blah, 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 blah. Oh, no, no, I don't do that in my sadness. Well, my sadness is mixed up, and it's different than his sadness. For one thing, I've lived a hell of a lot longer. So, and everything gets, pa gets patterned into our bodies. So to be able to have the freedom to have a mechanism to deconstruct that and to get back to the Emerson sadness is just such a gift. It does not decrease me or you. It just gives us as one of my students says, it, it takes you from an eight crayon set to a 64 crayon set. <laughs> so that's kind of fun too. Uh, also one thing I'd like to add too is when you get to a really extreme emotional uh, states that you have to dive into for your, for your, your work, um, sometimes it's hard to step out like you wear uh, your character home almost. And this gives you a tool to always step out and be in a place where you're not going to uh, attach um, emotion uh, that you have in your own life that might be damaging to yourself or to your work. Or others. Mm -hmm. and others yeah. as well. Yeah, you don't go home and kick the dog. <laughs> Seriously, you know, I mean, one of our, our very great, you know, current method actors, who was the fellow who played Lincoln? Daniel Day-Lewis. You know, he, had, he has said at one point in an interview, I'm not a good enough actor not to be method. Now, of course, he's a brilliant but, um, but he does, in order to do what he does, the way he does it, is he has to immerse himself, and he cannot come out until he's done with the project. He stays. He lost one marriage over it. And the wife was an actress, so it wasn't that she didn't get it. It's just he was playing difficult characters and came home and metaphorically kicked the dog, I have a feeling. So this really gives actors as well, uh, you know, a mechanism, I'm thinking, beginning to think beyond acting as well. But it gives actors a tool to understand the emotions as they are in the body. And then once you begin to understand your emotions and feel them, and it's where are they? You know, where is it stuck? Which muscle is contracting? So what we're about is observation. We're about know thyself in a whole new way. Okay, I think we have to move on, and I thank you so much for being with us. I will go to Panera Bread between 1 and 2 on Wednesday in the balcony for anybody who might be local and want to ask me more questions, or of course by email or by telephone. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Kaiva. Panera Bread. I, I thought there was only one. Um, I live such a circumscri circumscribed life in Alba. Um, 7th Avenue between 28th and 29th. Um, final note for the people who can't join us, this is actually available online. Uh, this is actually available online right now. Class, so, class notes. Um, yeah, class notes. Thank so you very, if anybody's very much. not here, you can just tell them. Cultureofoneworld.org, it's right up there. Cool, so we're, we're gonna do like a, thank you so much to Kathy and Kevin and Randy. Um, and uh, we're gonna, this is now we're going into the speedy mode. Um, back to back to back things happening. Um, and our next session uh, begins in about uh, three minutes. 
<laughs> and it's called Upstander or Bystander. Uh, it's moderated by Bianca, Bianca Bagaturian. It's an Armenian Dramatic Art Alliance session. And the panelists include Eric N., Greg Hittleman, and Leslie Amazian. Uh, and I'll briefly just say this. Uh, if you can make your, your coffee or whatever you need to do at the moment short, please do, because this is a quick turnaround. Thank you.
so we're heading back in. So if you're out there getting coffee or whatever, and you want to sit on down or stand, it's fine. <laughs> whatever you want to do, we're starting our next session. Uh, as soon as uh, Mr. M <laughs> sort of materializes from the back of the room, basically. Um, and on we go. And I'll, I'll hand it over to Bianca in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Go. Hi. So we're here at NOPE once again talking about atrocities and people in theater. And um, my wonderful guests today are playwright Leslie Ivasian, who also teaches at Columbia University, Greg Hittleman from the Enough Project in Washington, D.C., which we'll be hearing more about, I'm sure, and Eric N., head of playwriting at Brown University, and I don't think I need to introduce him any further. So um, I just wanted to say a, a couple of things. I wrote something, oh, my name is Bianca Bagatori, and I'm a playwright, and I run the Armenian Dramatic Arts Alliance and the $10,000 Williams Roy and Paul Human Rights Playwriting Contest. Um, I have been to Rwanda a couple of times with Eric, who takes groups over there, and um, done a lot of witnessing, and I, it's affected my work my, as a writer profoundly, and I thought this might be um, an interesting topic to, to discuss today. You know, what sort of moral obligation do we have once we witness someone's story or we, we hear it firsthand? Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to, to talk about, and also whether the role of theater and drama can actually be effective, is in any way effective. So what would I, experienced myself was that witnessing actually gave me knowledge and sometimes knowledge of harrowing horrific atrocities incomprehensible facts about all kinds of massacres slaughters and and once you possess this knowledge whether it's firsthand or through the stories of survival you come face to face with some kind of evil that is behind this and this just it really touches you on a personal level and it doesn't leave you and it stays with you. And whether your skill is writing or filmmaking or painting or drawing, it kind of goes there. And that's been my own experience anyway. So I just wanted to, um, to start. Maybe Eric, maybe we can start with you. And you started to take groups of playwrights, directors, students to Rwanda over 10 years ago now. And what instigated you to do that, what was the instigating factor, and, and how do you feel this has been effective in the real world? Well, a few things to say if I could work, work through uh, some thoughts. Um, uh, I think uh, the act of witnessing or socially conscious art is um, uh, sometimes useless, uh, sometimes minimally effective, and uh, sometimes substantially effective, but never wholly effective. So sometimes it is uh, distilled water, it's lifeless, it's, it's um, irrelevant. Sometimes it's like plankton, and sometimes it's like a whale. But uh, even a whale needs water. So, uh, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, or you know, famous examples of of cultural products that have, have shift, substantially shifted the conversation, haven't shifted it in a in a vacuum. Uh, it didn't come out of a vacuum in Harry Beecher Stowe's life, and and it made its changes in the culture in the context of other other changes that were going on. Um, that that said, the, uh, so this is part two, and then there'll be a part two. Part part two is uh, an example of. Why, why we shouldn't give up on it, despite the variable degrees of effectiveness. Um, say there is a person in a hospital bed dying of cancer, and this is a, a germane hypothetical. I, I think a, a lot of us have, have been in rooms like that, but say there is a person dying of terminal cancer, and you watch them die, and uh, nothing can be done, and they die. Then there's another person in another hospital bed who's dying of cancer. And there's nothing that can be done, and they pass away. But that second person passes away singing a Beatles song. And maybe their hearts are slightly elevated with joy. That song does nothing to prolong their lives. 
but I think it's nicer that they died with a spark of joy in their hearts. Or even if it wasn't, even if it was a sad Beatles song, if if they if they died with their heart in choir with a cultural conversation with every other person who knew that Beatles song, I just think it's better. So regardless of effectiveness, it's it's better that we do um, what we do. Um, uh, a priest pointed out to me once that every single person that that Jesus brought back from the dead eventually died. That th there, there was no cure for death, but there was a kind of quality of life or an uh, arena of realization that uh, made things just a bit nicer. So uh, lastly, the ideas of witnessing, that I think there can be um, uh, utter uh, helpless witnessing that can be practical. So you go to a place knowing that your art will fail or, or be irrelevant, but the fact that you are present, able to hear stories or, or to, to see what's going on, allows things more space, more creative space. You're actually a negative space in a way, but you amplify um, uh, creative potential in the community you enter because of your negative capability, I guess. There, there is um, dispassionate helpfulness. So let's say you do enter a circumstance and you cannot help but advocate for what you see. That even though you're remote from an experience of a particular kind of poverty or physical suffering, even though you may be uh, or may think yourself safe from it, you uh, you have to enter into the dialogue. You have to say that's wrong, or hey, everybody, look, that's wrong. I, I think as long as you understand your position, that you're outside of the experience and uh, own nothing of it, and can take no credit for anything going forward, then I think that's all right. And then there, then there is help, helpless empathy, and I think the, the work I do sort of falls into this category, where. Um, uh, in the second category, there's a Buddhist saying that, that you will not always feel your compassion. Compassion isn't necessarily an emotional experience. Compassion is a position, a relative position. But sometimes you can't help but feel and feel your way into, into a thing. Um, I, I hope uh, I'm unable to restrain my feeling in certain circumstances. So in working with child soldiers or, or uh, people who are homeless in, in Providence, Rhode Island, um, I, I can't help but get emotionally worked up about it and write works that are meant to get people emotionally worked up. In that case, I've got to really remember my helplessness, my, my basic helplessness, and write plays that are so damaged in form or so durational in experience that they can't be objectified, that the satisfaction of the play can't be in the emotional response but that emotions themselves become a way of tripping forward into some kind of activism. So in, in bringing people to Rwanda and Uganda, um, our, our first goal is to do nothing. Our uh, second goal is to do something without ownership. And our <coughs> third goal is to do something and uh, fail forward. Thank you, that was very succinct. <laughs> It's interesting also the, the form following the function. Um, thank you, Eric. Leslie, I wanted to um, address your work in being um, Armenian and from a family of survivors. I know that's affected a play you wrote 20 years ago that we all know about, and, and now 20 years later you have gone back and written another play that came generations after and how that pain and suffering has still trickled down throughout those generations. Um, do you want to address that and, and say how being a first-hand witness to your grandparents' stories affected your work? Sure. Um, my family lived in Turkey in 1915 when the Armenians were slaughtered by the Turks in a massacre that has never achieved um, actual historical clout. It isn't in any single history book anywhere. 
So this massacre of um, a million Armenians still is referred to as the alleged massacres. Now, if you grow up with that, you grow up with insanity. Because if your history is denied, it creates insanity. So my family <coughs> struggled with silence, struggled with not being able to speak about their past or refer to the family members that were killed in front of them. My grandmother's father was shot in the face at the pulpit. He was a minister and he was speaking. So I came from stories like that that sounded untrue to me because how could that be true? So I chose to write out of desperation to try to make sense um, of the sadness that I lived with and the despair and the number of suicides and the drug addiction that existed in my family. I did it for really selfish reasons um, and not very important reasons. And I didn't expect the play to be particularly important. My goal was to put something on stage in a main stage kind of fashion, not just in a church basement of Armenians who listen to their same story over and over again. And if you know any Armenians, you know that they have one story. They have this story. This is the story we write about. Because every generation since then feels beholden to tell the story, since it only lives in us. So since we've been chosen to tell the story, we have to live with that. And a way of telling it, a way of expressing it, is through theater because it has such a, a sacred and emotional relationship with the audience. Uh, so, so yes, 20 years ago I wrote a play which luckily had some traction and created some conversation and it's the first time it was referred to, the massacres were referred to in the New York Times without using the word alleged. Um, I got scared after I did that, to be really frank with you because I suddenly became a spokesperson for the Armenians, which meant that they asked me to carry all their grief. And not only that, they had demands. Do this one and do that one and don't do it this way and there's too much food and I don't know the language and that's not like my Aunt Sophia and, and, and. So I found myself going around and getting tired and getting mad at the Armenians and getting tired of the victimization of the Armenians and getting tired of what they wanted from me. I was a young mother, I didn't want to do that all the time. So I pulled away from the subject for a little while, but I came back. <coughs> and, and what I have to tell you is that I've, I've just written a new thing, um, which is that I decided to write something that was as, as distilled as anything could be. It has absolutely no production values, it's just me on stage telling stories. And I did it for the first time yesterday. And one of the things, I just stand on stage and tell stories. As a woman, no woman has done this. Men have done this. They have opened up their manuscripts and they have read their stories. Women do the lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. They dance it up and present it and make a big deal out of it. Men sit and read the stories. Women make it a dazzle razzle. And I now am doing this thing where I'm just standing on stage and telling a story. It's an amazing thing to do. And part of the story I'm telling is the Armenian story, of course. And in the audience last night was my endocrinologist, <laughs> who knows me really well and has seen all my stuff. And he said to me afterwards, everything you said about the Armenians sounds rote. And that's what happened. I've been saying the same things in the same way for too long. And so this morning I woke up and thought differently, and so it goes. Thank you. <laughs> That's interesting. Great. Can I ask you a question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot what the question was. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> Great. I would like to hear a little <laughs> bit about your organization and um, the work that you do, and sort of as an outsider looking into um, theater and drama and writing, how you look at its effectiveness and in, in what it role it can play? So um, last night, just by chance, I, uh, my girlfriend took me to see the, a performance of uh, 
really interesting interpretation of 1984 theatrical um, done by the Headlong Theater um, from the UK in Washington DC the Shakespeare um, theater great if you if you have a chance to see it it's powerful and shocking and um, interestingly conceived and deconstructed and, um, and very dramatic um, <coughs> As we left the theater, knowing that I was coming to this panel, I turned to my girlfriend and said, so do you think that the people who saw that play tonight would stand up in a moment of total futility um, in the face of injustice <coughs> at the risk of their own lives? And she said, I have no idea, but probably no more than anyone else might, having seen or not seen the play. So I think that touches on this idea of, of the futility of, of the act. Um, let me go back to a, another kind of an analogous experience that I had when I was young. I was uh, about 11 years old and uh, my father took my sister and I to go see the, the Anne Frank house. And um, in, in a way, the Anne Frank house is like a, a kind of interactive theatrical experience. You, you walk through this story, um, whether you had read her diary or not, and um, you know, experience this first person point of view of, uh, a, of a genocide. And as we were walking out of the very crowded Anne Frank house and these narrow, narrow stairwells and you're really packed in with all these tourists who are sort of being fed through this machinery of the house. And at the very end, this was in the 70s, um, there was a display about uh, the, something that was going on in South Africa um, called Apartheid, um, which was a, a, a racist government structure which segregated black people from white people and uh, was very oppressive and violent and in, in many ways, you know, resonant of, of some of the issues um, that were, you know, totally relevant to Anne Frank's life. And Everyone just walked by the display, didn't even look at it. No one even paused. Um, my dad, who's political and bossy, <laughs> <laughs> grabbed us and pulled us over and made us read the whole display and talk to us about it. And, and we left, but you know, again, this idea of futility. You know, um, All these people came out with this sort of virtual experience of um, uh, moral rectitude. Um, but when it really came down to it, here was something that was live and present. Um, they didn't glance twice at it. So again, this, this sense of, um, of futility. Uh, years later though, um, you know, here I am actually. I clock in on my daily job, which is the communications director at an organization called the Enough Project, which is um, headquartered in Washington, D.C., but we also have um, people stationed uh, in some of the areas where we, where we focus on, which are um, some of de Africa's deadliest conflicts, and our work is around prevention of atrocities and prevention of genocide, very specifically. So places like South Sudan and Sudan, Darfur, um, the Central African Republic, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, Somalia, and uh, I'm working in that space now. So, you know, did that particular experience embed itself in me, and did it empower me, and did it, um, you know, open up an avenue for engagement? Um, I think it was a, a piece of that. So that's one person. I don't know how many people went through the Anne Frank House who've gone through the Anne Frank House since. Um, and I don't know how many people it actually um, moved along some kind of ladder of engagement towards activism. 
um, but some percentage. That's really interesting. And, and I wonder about this, this whole futility of it. I mean, what it did was the Anne Frank House influenced you personally and the work you're doing today. I mean, I've been to Rwanda twice now, I think, with Eric, and, and I learned something that affected me personally, which was the most, I think, profound thing I learned there was that there is a particular, there was a particular set of people behind a genocide and an atrocity in Rwanda, as there was in the Armenian genocide, and that this, this whole thing could be stoppable and it could be soluble. And that was the, the thing that I learned. So for me, that was quite profound by going there and witnessing and being in person. That was what I took away. And maybe years from now, that will affect my work. So maybe it's not actually the work that we do and the effect it has on the audience, but the profound effect witnessing has on us as artists. And, and eventually, hopefully, that will seep out yeah, I mean, I think that's one that's one dimension. I mean, there you know, there's sort of this um, pat kind of response. Oh, if I can touch one person, you know, it makes it all worthwhile. And I think I don't know if that's really satisfying, honestly. Um, and I don't want to just rely on that. I think there are other pieces um, in my work as the communications director at the Enough Project, where you know, people who are working in, in as dramatists, as playwrights, as screenwriters, whatever, working with the word. Um, you have some, some, some outputs that are very functional for my work and can help me. So, um, you know, one example is, you know, you're, you're putting people out there in the world who have experienced some kind of um, virtual moment in live theater where they face, um, if, they're, if they're drawn into it in a way that's not handed to them on a, sil on a platter, and the theater play isn't like a kangaroo court where everyone's sort of on the same side and cheering, but it's complex and difficult. And there's a certain moment where people are challenged to think, well, you know, what would I do at that crossroads of, 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 of moral <coughs> choice? Um, that's kind of like a muscle memory that everyone in the theater has the opportunity to experience. And muscle memory in sports, you know, it's like, you know, you practice your shot or your swing or whatever it is, and you do it enough times when you get up there, in the moment you don't have to think about it. You just do what you've practiced doing, and you know how to do it. You know it's possible, and you do it. And you do it accurately and often well. Um, if not, you, know, you might you know, face a, a moral crossroads in your life, and it's new to you. It's unexpected. And you might be a great person who, makes an, who takes an action that you later regret. And you regret it because you haven't practiced it. You weren't ready. And when it came, you just didn't think it through, or you didn't have the opportunity to really feel it, and you made the wrong move. Um, when you have thought about, like think about 1984, think about an act like Winston Smith takes, where he writes something down that probably no one is going to see that says, down with Big Brother, and he's being watched and he feels that, you know, it's very likely that in that very moment of writing it down, he's going to be instantly incinerated, crucified, liquefied. Um, and no one will ever see that paper, and it's a compute, completely mad act, actually. Um, but he takes it. So there's also this opportunity to say to yourself, you know, in the extreme case, in the worst case scenario, if history doesn't bend towards justice, or you don't know whether it's going to, you know, how are you going to act in that particular moment? And that's an incredible challenge that allows people, some people maybe, who have been deployed out into the world, having gone through that muscle memory experience, to be like moral sleeper cells. They're out there, they're waiting, they're waiting to do the right thing. <laughs> I like that, moral <laughs> sleeper cells. <laughs> Eric, you did a play called Maria Casita, which we heard a reading of, I think, in Uganda. Um, and for this, you went to Belgium to hear the nun who had burned people in the genocide give her testimony in <coughs> court, and you were witness to that. Uh, tell us a little about that and what effect that had on the play. Um, well, uh, responding to some of what's, what's been said, it, it's, uh, I think we're moving in a good direction here. That it's right to start with futility. The, the world didn't get life right for many 
thousands of years. And so futility is an okay starting place. But now we're beginning to move into some of the positive effects of, of art for social change or, or compassionate art. Um, uh, and uh, this relates to me because you know, it seems we're on to two things. The one is that uh, theater can inform energetically and incompletely. So there was information I needed to digest and, and engage with in Marie Xero you know, trial transcripts and the first draft was hundreds of pages long and had all kinds of uh, data in it. Um, but I could never really get to the end of the data. It was all too complicated and I'm not a data guy. So I tried to uh, uh, put in a play uh, the idea of getting at information so that the, the, the vector of moving towards information would carry on into conversations and, and the play, to whatever extent it ever worked, um, led to some conversations where people um, got to recontextualize events. And this, uh, the other is this idea of practicing habits of virtue where um, if you see enough movies and people are kissing each other all the time, maybe you're a young kid and you're shy, the moment comes when it's time to kiss somebody and you've seen it done a thousand times, so you can kiss somebody, you can, you, you can do it. And that leads to bliss and communities and all kinds of things cascade. Um, uh, uh, I think the number one virtue that theater can practice, kissing is one of them, but uh, uh, is the idea of strangeness, and that goes to what you were saying with, with this, the problem of the rope, that at, in, at least in, in my faith tradition, at the heart of the tradition is welcome the stranger, and, and be the stranger who will be welcomed. Love the, love the stranger as yourself, which means be a stranger yourself. So a thing that theater can do is create a strange place in which you can enact and uh, ideate your strangeness and yet move forward. I can be strange and move. I can be strange and create. So Maria Cazito was attempted to be constructed in a way that was perpetually strange and off balance so that you would lose track of suspense or character or uh, uh, some of the conventions of theater. Uh, Emily Mendelssohn is in the audience. She did a, a, a bang up job of directing the piece. When done properly, the play is not interminably long. So you, you don't have to stay in this strange place forever. <laughs> but, but it's meant to be uh, a place where you can practice being strange. And uh, that means uh, being in common with every other being on the planet. Together, we're all strange. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So incomplete information and the practice of strangeness. Can I talk to that? Just say, I just think that what a wonderful thing just to use the word strange and 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 how inspiring for anybody to be in theater to to identify what is strange and embrace what is strange about yourself and give yourself the opportunities to experience that and i think one of the things that i find about being a writer i was an actress before i was a writer and by and teaching playwriting at columbia is that I, I really encourage my students to think about the words we use in theater because they can get tired and we don't know what we're saying. And, and we think that we're actually moving forward with a kind of boldness. But, but I, I shy away from words like important. I shy away from words like heroic. I, I definitely move toward words like strange. But even that is a word you need to think about. And, and one of the words that I think, for instance, like I'm very much admiring of what both of you do. I'm, I'm, I'm not really a witness. I'm, I'm too scared to do that. I, and I'm not a traveler. I don't go to places. I, I'm, I'm just, I came from an Armenian family who came from Armenia and then never went anywhere outside of Tenafly. It just, it just didn't happen. We didn't travel. So I witness things very personally, very, my experiences are very emotional, personal, and in my social life. But one of the things that I urge anybody who is interested in the arts is to think about what voice means, just the word voice. Because we use it a lot in the theater. And I think it's a word that needs to be earned when we say, what is our voice? What is your voice? And how do you learn that? And to me, what it has become is, what are my questions? And if you can actually think about what are my questions, it will take you to that strangeness. It's a way to go. Um. So, 
thinking about strangeness also, um, I think one of the one of the services that writers can do um, to support our work in in activism, in pushing policy change, um, in in uh, research in our research work that educates in our um, in in our uh, in our communications work um, that builds communities um, is for people to also use the power of reporting. And I think that goes to asking questions. Um, you know, a, a play can be about something that is you know, very personal to you, um, but it can still include things that aren't just within that category of you know, write what you know. Um, it can be something, it can be write what you are learning. Or what you want to learn. Or what you want to know, or what you're trying to find out. And uh, I think that that is very empowering in terms of, you know, writers who are s struggling with that, you know, blank page. Like, you know, what am I going to write about? And so often, you know, you'll see in, like, classes of writing, people writing about things that, you know, even in their own hearts, they feel that they're banal. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> there is no subject that is banal, really, if it's treated properly. Um, everything can be <coughs> strange and magnificent um, and meaningful. But I would encourage you to, to think about the possibilities of stretching into places that you don't know, that are mysterious, and, um, and doing research, and going places, or, or, and not even just physically going places. Mm -hmm intellectually going places, historically going places, um, and asking questions. So that's, that's something else that you can contribute um, to helping bring awareness around issues and also shifting discourse on issues. And just you know, one other piece of that functionally is you know, when you think, going back to 1984 again, you know, there's this possibility as writers to, to empower a conception uh, Orwell said something like, you know, one time he, he was thinking about music and thinking how, you know, a tune can be propagated beyond the life and presence of, of, of a composer into all kinds of future realms and other realms um, unconceived, um, but that it lives on. And in the same way that, like, I guess Richard Dawkins talks about the, the meme and this idea of a cultural um, piece that takes on its own virality and, and life and moves through culture. Um, and that's something that I'm always looking for, is a, you know, finding a way to distill something that is very complicated, like or, or arcane or or, or um, wonky, like kleptocracy. Mm -hmm. You know, how can violent kleptocracy that is taking place in South Sudan, for example, or in Sudan, um, and you know where? And actually, there's a great um, piece that I would recommend everyone read, Nick Kristoff in the New York Times this weekend called, you know, when um, soldiers are more, more <laughs> feared than crocodiles, I think is the title. Please read it, it was this weekend. He goes to, to South Sudan and experiences this, this, this realm, but he, what he's doing is he's creating an idea in people's minds, a, a mini, a micro narrative or a micro structure that people can actually share. I can take that, you know, I can take that. Think about a, 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 phrase, a phrase like, politically incorrect, which I think has, is being deployed so d violently to oppress people right now, um, to shut people up from standing up against oppression and racism. Um, that's, you know, on the flip side, a, a way that words and conceptions can become viral in a, in a negative way, but you can also deploy a word like genocide, like Raphael Lemkin, in, you know, brought this word forth and now it's international law. So you can all, play that role. You can, you can deploy words that I can then take and further amplify, and other people who work in my business can further amplify, and activists can use to, to understand and can shape and shift policy. So you know, even if only a thousand people see your play um, in, you know, in a cycle of iteration, or a couple hundred or a dozen people see it, that conception, if it has virality, could potentially live on for years, that tune continuing to play, and you know, 
being incredibly impactful. Can, uh, uh, we're moving into Mac Wellman territory. So <laughs> I was just, just going to say, good. Good. Mac good. always says, write what you don't know about being contrary as he is. So there's the idea of the strange, but it also goes to goes to Fornes and to Spankmeyer and the uncanny, that there's the idea of the strange, and then there's this idea of, of the right word, but then there's the idea of X, which is a Wellman concept, that uh, poetic language can be very firm formula for the unknown, so it's algebraic, uh, rather than uh, the answers or the, the engineering. It's, it's problems that don't have the answers in them. So some, a misuse of art, a frequent misuse of art, is that doctors want to get a community to take HIV drugs, for example. And they'll go into the community and say, take HIV drugs. And the community is not just not getting it, or uh, it's not, the link isn't being made. So they'll go to artists and say, write us a play that says, take HIV drugs. So plays will come out and somebody will come downstage and say, take IV drugs. And it doesn't, it's not working. What might work better is the algebraic equation where a problem is posed whose solution is inevitably the taking of HIV, these HIV drugs. But uh, uh, what you want to give the, the community is uh, 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 the, the problem, the problem and a way of working through it that could lead to lowered corruption or sobriety or, or whatever. And I'm, I'm speaking of communities in Providence, Rhode Island, or, or wherever they may be. Um, uh, so uh, genocide is a, is a very good word, very important word, but it's also a quantity and it's, it, it can be devalued in a way that X, which has no quantity in it yet, <laughs> can't be devalued. So classically, it's something I've said before, genocide became law, became a an absolute terminal line, the worst thing possible, and triggered international response. Then George Bush, the younger, uses geno genocide to describe what's going on in Sudan to demonstrate that he could use the word without any meaning, that we, he, we could call something a genocide and no longer have to respond to it. So that's where artists need to re-intervene and create the algebra of, of atrocity. What, what is the formula for a soul sickness that, that will uh, result in ethical uh, emergency action? Yeah, that's, that's great. And I, I guess I'd like to add to that. I, I think we've talked about this on these panels before. When you have atrocities such as war and genocide where people are stepping outside of the rules of society, there aren't words enough to describe that, that atrocity. And so you must almost like step out of the rules of grammar and language and create new language and new words, which is the Matt Bowman territory, to sort of be able to match the atrocity. Because there are no words to describe what happens when you kill a million people. That, you know, that is just so inconceivable. So I think that's part of our poetic, I guess, license we can take and, and some of the tools we have to play with. I also wanted to touch on the, um, just lightly on the subject of moral obligation. I feel when I, when I hear someone's story that I'm then carrying the weight of their story and I always feel like I need to, to pay back or do something with that and, and that's sort of a, heavy weight to carry. I remember I was listening to 800 hours, I was digitizing 800 hours of Armenian genocide oral histories and it was so depressing and you're carrying all these people's stories. Or like what do you do and what responsibility? Maybe Leslie, you can speak to that. Do you feel, as an artist, when you have your family stories, do you feel some sort of moral <laughs> responsibility to deal with this in your art? I, I could never have done what you did. I, I couldn't listen to 800 hours. I would be overwhelmed by that. It was very overwhelming. It was I, over I, a long stretch of time. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't know how to get around that and get a point of view, and I, I, that would overwhelm me. My experience is a small experience. I keep, I keep emphasizing that, because small experiences are of value, too. Um, you know, I, I'm not really grand. <laughs> I can't handle big numbers like that. Um, I have my family. My family, where my grandmother would sit in silence and stare out the window like this for long periods of time. And 
was so clear that she was looking at something else. And just the image of her looking out the window is enough for me to write from. And that my father was a physician along with all the brothers in his family and his father. His father was forced to serve in the Turkish army taking care of Turkish soldiers when they returned to camp after a day of killing Armenia. My father took care of them. And as a result of that, my father and his brother and his mother were able to leave Turkey and come to America. And they came as broken people. They didn't have language. They didn't have a place. They were persecuted, and no one cared. And that's all I knew. I knew that I had some facility with language. I knew that I was brave enough to try. And so after working as an actress and having a modest career, moving along just fine but not great, I easily put acting aside. I happily had a child. And then I sat down and I wrote a play called Nine Armenians, which was my family story. <coughs> and I also wrote that play when my parents were alive. After my parents died, I wrote an entirely different play, which was Vicious. The first play was a happy family in a driveway who suffered sometimes. The second play, play was in a psych ward with a man tied to the bed. And that was my true story. And it took me 22 years to get to it. So we all have our, I, I'm just, <coughs> All I want to say is there's a certain tolerance of getting to know yourself and, and understanding what your limits are and then try to push them a little bit. But there's a lot of information if you're willing to look at yourself and be with yourself and see what, in what way are you brave. I've come to think of myself as a brave person despite all my fears and phobias. I figured out the ways that I'm brave. It allows me to write more authentically, if that helps you or means anything. Did I answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Greg, you were saying something interesting about the, um, maybe you could just relay the story about the elephant poaching that, and, and working on, on something that helped actually change a law in Congress or something. I mean, that to me is, is amazing that you can have that kind of impact. Well, I, I, I think I'll, I can touch on that. Um, and I think what's, what's important is, you know, we, we started at futility. And I think that that's important. I think coming at this, um, if you want to write and you want to engage and you want to be an activist, any of those kinds of things, <coughs> um, you do have to, on some level, come to it with some level of humility. Otherwise, you're, you're insane. Um, there might be moments where you get excited and you feel that um, the possibilities uh, for change are imminent and, 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 and enormous. And sometimes that's the case. I mean, there are transformational moments in history. And, but I think that, and, and, and the other piece of it is going back to that idea of, you know, as, as a creative person, you know, the possibility of, of having anxiety around, you know, what am I going to write about? And, you know, an empty, an empty page, an empty canvas. Um, and, and thinking about, oh, you know, everything has already been written about. <laughs> you know, and all, uh, like, Shakespeare, you know, it's over now, <laughs> after, sh or something like that. Um, there's nothing on that grand scale that I can address. There's nothing of that significance, even close to it, that I can engage with. And so m my work has to be marginal, it has to be, um, constrained and limited um, and possibly narcissistic. Um, I don't think that's true at all. I think that we are all living in a moment where all around us and within ourselves are dramas and, and um, situations and moments, of, uh, and moments of moral crossroad um, that are as powerful, important, dramatic, critical, urgent as anything in all of human history. 
right now for every single one of us. Um, and, 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 you know, I work on, you know, crises in deadly conflicts in Africa, but, I mean, it's in, it's, it's in our American electoral process right now. It's, uh, it's in your house, probably. It's in your neighborhood, no, most definitely. Um, it's something that you see every day. It's there. Your content is there. Um, are you willing to engage with it in a way that is courageous in the sense that it's honest to yourself and to your limits? Um, coming at it humbly with ambition, I guess, would be a, a way to think about it. Um, and then go back to you know what can happen. So uh, just in the last couple of years, um, we've been working on many different issues, human atrocities, but we've become recently more involved in dealing with um, the trafficking and poaching of, of elephants in particular in Africa because of the human toll. Um, we come to it from a human atrocity perspective and there's uh, really incredibly violent groups that are funded and fueled and incentivized <coughs> by some of the profits in the, in the ivory trade, just for example. So our group was drawn into some work in that space. And we've became involved in this last year in trying to help push some legislation uh, in Congress around um, anti-poaching, global anti-poaching. And we were able, through our efforts, to actually um, engage a, an activist community, to advocate directly on the Hill, um, to do, do research from the field and bring original information back and sh share those stories. Um, work with artists uh, and creative people. Um, one person that we worked with was uh, Oscar-winning director Catherine Bigelow, who, who was incredible in helping with this, with this effort, um, who did a, a short film about, about it and the human toll and the human side of it and the, arm, the empowering of, and, and profiting by armed groups uh, in the, in the tra ivory trafficking space. And at the end of last year, we were actually able to create, um, to create such momentum that, um, and I can say for once, in our, in our work often you can't say, lots of different people working in these spaces, but in this particular case, we helped push legislation over the tipping point. Um, in the House, a bipartisan group came together, if you can imagine it. Tea Party Republican to you know, progressive Democrat came together around a bill and passed in the House the Global Anti-Poaching Act, which is now in the Senate. And we're now pushing hard to, to get that passed. And once that passes in the Senate, we will actually have a, a powerful, impactful law that doesn't just you know, wag its finger at, at the others in another country, but in fact looks at the international um, financial system, looks at anti-money money laundering, and lots of things that the US government can do actually functionally to impede that very violent for both elephants who are teetering on extinction um, and human beings who are um, facing atrocity as a result of that trade. So um, that had a lot to do with storytelling. I would say half of what we did in that advocacy campaign was literally just sharing <coughs> narratives. Thank you. Um, I think we're almost done, but I'd like to open it up. Are there any questions anyone has for our panelists? Um, to what extent do the playwrights think that it's important to implicate the spectator in the events that you're talking about, in the um, whatever the atrocity is? Um, and to what extent do you think it's just important to uh, tell the story of what happened? Um, I, I don't really believe in audiences. That I don't know that they exist. I, I've never seen one. I don't, I don't know what, I, I don't get that concept, what an audience is, but. A spectator, uh, well, somebody's seeing it. Yeah, I, I think we're all making a thing, we're all making a thing together. So that, that a play recognizes its radical incompleteness and rely in uh, humble parody on the energies of everyone in the room 
is is vital to me. I mean, to a certain extent, I know what you, I know what you mean. But it really, more and more as I get older and crankier, I, I just don't I don't feel an audience. I don't feel like I'm speaking from myself to to another place. I I'm only interested in harmonizing with energies that I perceive. So I try to move myself towards heat and share share in that heat. I speak in a certain way or with a certain vocabulary, but it's it's no more privileged than the silence of the audience if they if they happen to be a silent audience or the squealing of the audience if I'm the Beatles or whatever. That, that all together all together we're making the one the one sound and it all it all counts. So the idea of either a playwright or a play that's sort of famous or tips down from an elevated place and spills out into an audience that an audience then has to um, appropriate that that I don't I don't like that conveyor belt. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. So I'm just practically speaking, I'm interested in forms well like storytelling, where anybody can make can join the story circle. Or um, uh, you just you write plays that are so big and take so long to produce that they have uh, casts of a hundred. So that it doesn't really matter if anybody ever shows up to see it because you've all <laughs> made it. You know, people all made it together. Can I, can I ask you, are, are you using the word spectator because of the director Eugenio Barba? Are you referring to him? Or is that your word, no, spectator? No, I'm just using it as the person who observes what is happening uh -huh. in the space, who right. didn't necessarily write it. I'm just asking right, yeah. an intention and an interest in whether, as as a writer, you're interested in implicating the listener, right. or whether it's just an offering to them of something you think they should know about. Right. Well, what I find with the playwrights that I work with is that when when we take in consideration what we think we want the audience to do, or what we think we want to share with the audience, or how we're going to inform the audience, or how we're going to teach the audience, immediately a shift happens to the work itself that makes it less sincere. Mm -hmm. It becomes a little condescending. Many things, but that's the word that came to mind right now. It becomes a less innocent project and the, the wonderful contradiction about theater, and everything about theater is a contradiction, if, if we all know that you're there, you must be there for this to survive, but there is an importance to understand that what's happening is very personal and very honest, and the investigation isn't personal investigation. I don't really think you can write plays with the audience in mind. It becomes self-conscious. Segways become too long. Backstories become too long. Things become, they start feeling like sitcoms, which is a very different thing. You know, so I think that we tell, if you tell an honest story, your spectators will spectate. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm thinking about Holly Hughes and Karen Finley and people who I think um, spoke from a particular perspective in making their work um, yes. that I think yeah. really did. Um, I think of Holly saying it's about who gets to tell their story yeah. and about how events implicate people. Yes. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking about this conference, which is on spectatorship. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking about how how to address people seeing uh, stories of atrocities and what effect it can have on them. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to just recommend to everybody, if you haven't heard of Eugenio Barba, th that you look him up. He has the most wonderful book called On Dramaturgy and Directing, and then in parentheses he says, Burning the House. He, he addresses much of what you're talking about right now, which is why I thought you would just come off that book. Yeah. Eugenia Barba is his name. Great. Right. Emily, did there. you have a question? I, I second that, but just to, to follow up if I can, that I think the spectator in the transaction is the play. Yeah. The, the play is watching the audience. Yeah. Really. I see. And yeah. listening closely to the yeah. audience and reporting back on what they've heard. Yeah. Yeah. Emily, did you have a... Uh, she, she handed it to me. I'm not sure about it. 
Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I just want to uh, problematize that a little bit, and maybe it's for the cultural appropriation uh, uh, session later. But um, just in speaking to you, I, 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 I feel strongly about this because I make work that comes from communities that are usually international communities and usually is being shown to an audience that's not of that community. So I think actually there is a setting in which who the audience is and thinking about that is extremely critical to the work. And I've seen a lot of work, frankly, done that is highly problematic because it's not thinking about that. So the difference between a work that's created by, let's say, an Arab um, playwright for their community, about their community, engaging with the, the political critique of their society that then is brought here and shown to a community that has absolutely no knowledge of that society other than it's a barbaric place where people kill each other over sectarian whatever, or whatever um, stereotypes we have in our minds. So I'd love it if you could speak as people who are working in international context to um, whether and how you think about um, the way that certain stories either reinforce or problematize um, the, the ideas that um, a, a, spec, a body of people who are not involved in the creation of the story and have not lived anything close to the story often um, witness that um, and how that affects their perception of places and particularly cultures that are already marginalized, dehumanized, and stereotyped. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, the, in, in any transaction, it, the, the events must not be exotic or merely exotic. And in moving a piece into different circumstances, the exoticism has to be mitigated. So the, a, a mantra over the past couple of years for me has been aesthetics is reciprocity. It, are, you, are you representing your piece in a way where there's an equal exchange between uh, giver and receive? So this idea of hospitality again, which uh, is our strangeness mutual to each other, rather than uh, you're the authorized consumer of my exotic product. Yeah. And I, I think I would add to that, first of all, one piece just being giving agency to the, the constituency that is uh, participating in that, ex in that theatrical experience, um, whether to bring people in from those communities to participate in the construction of it um, or in the production of it, um, or to um, find a way to open it up for that engagement. Um, I think for me, uh, just as someone who loves theater and enjoys and has, a, has had a lot of um, powerful experiences um, in, that, in, that, in that space, um, there's a kind of, there's a difference I think, um, and I, I don't know how to really define how it's constructed differently, but sometimes a, a play that has supposedly moral content of some kind, can really feel like, I think I used this term before, like a kangaroo court. You know, everyone in the audience is sort of told, you know, villain, hero, judge, we all judge in this way, this is the judgment, and everyone walks out with sort of this shared sense of, 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 of rectitude, right? But no one has been challenged to really understand um, or have any empathy um, for the real, real problems uh, inherent in, in that drama. Um, there is no, there, there's no opening space, there's no danger, there's no risk. It's not live, it's can't. It actually, look, a play is written, so you know, in a way, Allah has already predestined what everyone's gonna do on stage, sort of. Um, but when, when you're really experiencing either, I guess on the, as an actor or a director or a writer, but also as someone in the audience um, who's, in, you know, there's a, there's a moment where you can forget that it's not happening right then. And in fact, sometimes it really is almost happening right then. And it feels so much on the edge of, of being truly live and present and with every possibility that, you know, that's when you have like someone, even in a movie, like stand up in the audience say, don't go into the closet. They're gonna, you know, there's a guy with an ax. <laughs> Right, like as if you know the film reel isn't already rolling out, but to to have that sense of of, of risk and danger where you really are challenged to feel that um, it could go any which way, and what would you do? Um, it's a different. It's it, it. Then you're not in the kangaroo court anymore. Now you're in a place where people can actually yeah, I think we have, have that mus build that muscle memory. Yeah. 
You know, just on a, a very personal level, I wondered about what it would be like to have an Armenian play happen in Turkey. And this last play that I've been writing that is the, the vicious one, the hard one, the one that's really out there, I've been writing that for three years. And over the course of the three years that I've been writing that, I moved back into New York City, and I happened to move across the hall from a Turkish family. <laughs> exactly across the hall. They're five feet from us. There's an entirely Turkish family, and I decided to knock on the door. This is a completely personal, one-on-one -on -one story, and say, I would like to ask you what you think happened to the Armenians in 1915. And we sat down, and we had that conversation. However, she was a denier. She said the Armenians instigated it, and I had to listen to that. I had to listen to it. It didn't happen. We don't think it happened. We don't agree with you, and, I, and I'm on the other side of the wall writing all the stories that I know. And yet it was a step. It was an interesting step. And what would the next step be after that? I, I, I think I've I wasted time, though, of uh, uh, fighting your questions, and I think they're really good questions. So I hope more time yeah. will be spent. And, and I, I'd like to just close with, I think writing the best story possible is what I found in my experience has transcended all the different sort of cultures and just to try and write the best possible thing you can. I'd like to thank all my guests there again. extent I've been able to um, uh, approach it, I sense that it advertises detachment, that let, let go, let go. And I, I can talk about emotions in that term, too, I guess. Um, uh, nothing means anything. It's all illusion. But feel a little bit happy. And that's a philosophy that really resonates with me. I go, I go with that. That as so in, in Catholic terms or in certain Christian traditions, that you're an utterly contingent being. That you're you you are not able to save yourself. Something else will save yourself. You're completely helpless. But you should kind of suspend yourself in a matrix of happiness. That worthless as you are, you should probably be a little bit happy. And there's, it becomes axiomatic, and it goes to the idea of X. So the, in, in the algebra of existence, the, the premise is that happiness is a little bit better to have than unhappiness, and that there is a level of happiness which is optional, so that you can actually choose to have it. So um, art is part of the optional happiness that's available to contingent humans <laughs> hanging in dread over the canyon of doom. That we can hang there singing, ooh, I need your love, babe. And, and maybe hang there is a little bit better. And going, going to um, detachment and, and it, it, emotions, I was thinking about em, emotions and experience that I feel I'm, so my position as a writer is this idea of um, uh, helpless empathy, that I can't, I can't help but having these feelings that I have, but understanding that I'm, that my, what I mean by helpless in that situation is that my feelings don't really matter or aren't really doing anything. I mean, they matter to me, I guess. Maybe they matter to the people I'm hurting with them, but um, uh, they're not what it's really about. I'm not moving 
towards an emotional satisfaction. I'm not moving bearing my emotions forward. I'm not moving <coughs> through emotions. When I crawl forward helplessly towards some evolutionary progress or towards some light that draws me on, some happiness that I'm aspiring to, um, emotions are the gravel underneath my knees. They're, they're the problem that I move a across. So uh, I think theater can waste a lot of time trafficking in emotions because emotions like, like crack are sa saleable. People seem to like them. And they, they can be easily reduced and rapidly transferred. They're the Bitcoin of human experience, em emotions. Or they can be. They can be cheap or, or virtual that way. Um, uh, I, I think theater is better at uh, helping us get past emotions to something that's really not private property. Yeah. It's not about our experience. It's about that which experiences us or the big experience that's beyond all description. Sam Shepard has a nice essay about that where, where he, was, he, he was in acting and he was on a motorcycle that was uh, t bolted to the back of a, a truck with a camera on it. And he was like driving somewhere with real intent, with this manly American intent. <laughs> and he had an earpiece in his head, and the director was saying, more emotion, ha experience more emotion. And so he was trying to experience more emotion, <laughs> feeling all these things. I'm, I'm really having an experience now. And he started feeling really proud of himself. Oh, I'm really, wow, I'm acting. I'm experiencing things. But then the truck hit like a bump in the road. And his motorcycle uncoupled and he flipped. He, he flipped and fell in the motorcycle crash. And he's fine now. Sam Shepard's fine. <laughs> this was a long time back. <laughs> but uh, it was as if the universe said, not that experience. <laughs> this experience. There's gravity and serendipity and things like that. So I like, I like a, um, a theater that recognizes that uh, there are forces in and around it that are superior, are superior to it. And that it, it's, it is most ethical when it's leading us to uh, abandon uh, emotions or rise above emotions uh, insofar as their attachments. So that's my five minute intervention. <laughs>
and director, and I teach here at Gallatin and at SUNY Purchase in the theater and performance program. Hi, I'm Vasanti Saxena. Okay, thank you. <laughs> And um, I'm a playwright and one of the other co-founding members of the Temblers, which is a um, Los Angeles Playwrights Collective. And um, that's it. Hi, am I good? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm David Herskowitz. I'm a director, and I run a small theater company here in New York called Target Margin Theater. So that was perfect. Um, and now I think we're going to engage in something, hopefully, that's akin to conversation although maybe there's something presented, but for the most part, I hope we're kind of bat the ball in the air and you know, keep it up as long as we can, and maybe you'll help us too. Uh, the definitely the, the theme of the panel is something was inherited, um, and it's a good thing to inherit. Um, the epic theater, uh, I'm going to bore you for a moment with, it's not boring, but the, maybe some of the original definitions from Piscator, from, uh, Brecht, uh, I've tried to do a paraphrase, just to remind you, epic theater, uh, not necessarily anything with Roman gladiators, but um, rather, could be, could be, but resisting a more powerful opponent, no, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at my wrong notes, <laughs> looking at judo, for those who were here earlier. Here it is, so indeed, epic and sometimes called dialectical theater, uh, suggests that a play should not cause the spectator to identify simply in emotional terms with the character's or action on the stage, but rather should provoke radical self-reflection for the viewer, address issues of contemporary existence, and provide a critical view independent from popular forms and or expectations. Uh, so according to this vision of Piscator and Brecht, um, epic theater appeals to reason over emotion, alienation, difficult word, over catharsis, and utilizes an episodic uh, structure instead of that Aristotelian unities that we might expect. But indeed, definitions change, and I think that's the most exciting part of being alive, is watching definitions change. And so we're here to possibly think about what epic theater means in our hands at this moment. I've devised a few questions, but I think I'll just throw it out to you right at the beginning and then just continue to spice the pot. What's epic theater to you guys? And feel free. Now, in your hands. I don't think of my work as epic theater per se. I definitely use episodic structure and fragmented structure. Uh, for me, the thing that sustain is sustained in my work is a fragmented um, associative structure rather than a linear um, Aristotelian, you know, um, rising action climax, denouement, I don't really use that structure. Um, so I think for me, what came from uh, Brecht is the idea of making strange as a way to startle people into um, paying attention or looking at it differently. Um, I, I don't think of my work as Brechtian per se, but I think that I learned some of this from some of his strategies, and specifically from Walter Benjamin, who talked about how in the modern era we experience life as a series of uh, shocks or fragments rather than a sustained experience. Um, and I think some of that carries into my work. I'm really interested, you know, with the kind of Brechtian definition of epic theater, the idea that emotional catharsis makes an audience complacent. Um, and from working on a few different pieces recently, you know, the piece I'm working on now and my most recent play, um, you know, looking at wanting to enact theater that has some sort of social movement to it, where you're exploring an idea with the, you know, hope and intention that that creates a thought process within someone's, you know, within your audience um, that might make them want to behave differently. Um, and I think my personal aesthetic always just veers to the theatrical, so I've always enjoyed 
you know, breaking the fourth wall and playing with time and these kind of larger, you know, you know, what makes a play different than a movie, you know, just this really kind of theatrical aesthetic. And with an epic theater kind of examining the idea that that aesthetic isn't just because it's fun, it's because that really can potentially motivate a different kind of response to a play. Um, so that to me is really kind of what I try to pull out of it. Yeah, I've experimented with writing episodically and failed miserably. So um, <laughs> I like to um, begin with uh, some like realism and complacency and then use different strategies to um, either slowly or suddenly subvert that like kitchen sink kind of situation um, once I guess the audience might be somewhat lulled um, because that you know that gives a bit of a shock and then you can um, from that point start to question what is like what is the everyday what is the the more banal existence and what is sort of lying underneath um, how can it so easy easily be flipped what is constructed the, fir the first reality that you saw initially um, so just sort of playing with that from this initial you know this initial kind of flattened space I think I'm like you Vasanti I sort of veer towards um, sort of basic realism um, and I started playing with time by accident like it just came in the writing process and it scared the shit out of me and I was like where, where am I in this story okay what's happening and I kind of I don't want to make it sound like you know the characters talk to me and I, I mean because people you know playwrights sort of have their different process but as I was writing it I was really surprised and felt um, somebody was talking about the coming to your piece with humble um, you know the humble expectations or humble uh, um, ambition and that's exactly sort of what happened and I wrote this piece where I just felt like I couldn't tell the story in that natural sort of uh, not kitchen sink but you know real-time space which is how I was taught at Sarah Lawrence um, just something has to happen in this 30 minutes and you know like it, what it, it's you know I was t taught like it's more exciting minute one to minute 31 like keep it in that room what happens in that and that that's a totally fine thing and it works for some things <laughs> but I found myself um, not because I think that I was trying to shock the audience but more because the story needed to be told in a in a way that was bigger than that 30 minutes and you have to sort of listen to that and someone was earlier was saying just write the best play that you can and so for me that was part of it is just adding that epic idea and then seeing how far it could go um i guess that i experienced this question in my working life uh, primarily as a matter of of difference that is to say, it always seems to me that there are a lot of people in the theater who spend enormous energy and effort collapsing differences, erasing differences, or collapsing the space between things that are different, and that just doesn't excite me. I, the opposite thing excites me. So, for instance, th they take a play and they, they want the audience just to fall into it. They want to do, they're killing themselves to put whatever's happening on stage as close as possible to the to the audience and make the audience feel like they're in it and so they're that they all that and so then th it becomes about standards of believability about like forgetting things and just losing yourself in that or or the believability of the emotion that's happening on stage that we go with all that stuff and uh, or, or collapsing the space between an actor and a role like we're really we're really gonna we're just gonna erase that and they're gonna become like one but it that's just not how I live these things I I I always see all, both of those things or all of them and I'm always excited by the difference. I'm excited by saying, wow, that's something I totally don't know and have never seen. That's tremendously electrifying to me. Or when I'm watching an actor on stage, I never forget that it, there's an actor there <laughs> really and I still love it, allowing myself to forget on some level and say, oh God, I can't believe he's gonna do that. You know, because I get that they're creating some, you know, a putative fictive reality on stage, and the game, the, the rules of that game, they're 
creating, as is so often the case, are to get me to accept those rules and kind of in, indulge in and embrace that fictive reality. And so I can enjoy going along with that, but I never forget it. And in my own work, I'm always engaged with, and that's not a project that interests me at all. It's a project that essentially is inert. It has its pleasures, but it's, it's a fairly base pleasure. And the pleasures that I get from seeing all those difference, those differences kind of flashing around on the stage, that's what turns me on. And so the moment that you do that, then all kinds of other things become possible that I think circle back to connect to more traditional received ideas about what epic theater is in that Brechtian, original Brechtian sense that you're thinking of. And, and so the work looks that way because it's not about saying, come drown in this. It's not about saying, wow, she's really crying, or <laughs> you know, all those things. Um, what a great Polish accent, right. or, you know, <laughs> the things that people yeah. do. I love these answers. Um, so in a certain way, each of you have touched it, and I wonder if we could just touch it a bit more. You know, and it, I think it comes down to our, at least our moment for the next 45 minutes or thereabouts, but you know, what's real to us? And what is not real? And, you know, real is a real and easy thing? Is it a very difficult thing? Is it an overfull one train going downtown, you know, and stuck between stops? Or is it, you know, what is it? And what is it on stage and what might it be for the pieces you're working on right now? What's real? And how might you push the real? And as you're feeling the real in your work right now. And then what is not real? In a sense, what are we, what are we creating? What are we, what are we, what are we making of? Um, I'm working on a piece right now that's kind of inspired by the serial podcast, the first one with Adnan. I know a bunch of you were probably addicted to it like I was. Um, and <coughs> a lot of my friends, we were all sort of binge listening, um, which I think is amazing because people don't listen to anything <laughs> anymore. And so we're all like podcasts, like there are no <laughs> visuals. It's amazing. Um, but at the end of the podcast, I don't know, but I felt very um, – incomplete because I felt like was this real like was this whole thing trying to determine whether or not this young man was guilty of this murder and I was going along the on the along the journey with this woman who was my guide Sarah um, and then she let me kind of down I felt like because I don't know and she seemed to be totally okay with like me not knowing I mean like yeah that's crazy I don't know if he did it or not okay so serial sec season two and I'm like hold up, wait a minute, um, we left him there, like we left the story there, and so I got inspired to write this play about what is our responsibility to that guide, that narration, um, especially as writers, like we're taking you on a journey, um, and throughout that journey as playwrights, we care, like we care about this story, we care about guiding people to something, um, at which point are we allowed to let go of your hand and have you experienced this and ha not have you as the person who's involved feel like we let you down and so that that line of reality is something that we're always pushing but sometimes it doesn't obviously get pushed to the point where you know you leave a piece feeling sort of incomplete and I want to take that further and figure out like how can I not give you the bow tie ending right and then but how can I also not make you feel like, am I supposed to clap now? Like, is this the end? Like, what is the, <laughs> you know, like when you go see a play and you're like, I don't, I don't know if that was the end or not. Oh, okay, <laughs> great, yay, you know, but there's a me medium there, right? And I want, and as a writer, I want to explore what that is. I, I, um, I love this question about reality in theater because I, I feel like I'm a sort of um, fatally limited person in this regard because uh, to me it's all real it's always all real it's like I, I I always have these curious experiences where somebody on a production says do you want a real banana or a plastic banana and the only answer I ever can give is but a plastic banana is real <laughs> I mean it's all you know that's what's so exciting to me about the theater is that uh, you know ultimately finally everything on stage has the same ontological status you know it's all equally real and that's real um, it's not always very realistic, right. which is a different question. Right. Film is fabulous at being realistic in ways that we never will be, of course, of course. But but it's like it always makes me think of the. Um, I think this is a true story that a friend of mine told about being having an oral exam uh, at the School of Social Thought in the University of Chicago, where he was being examined on Hamlet, and the examiner said, "Do you think the ghost in Hamlet is real?" And the and the 
student gave what to me is now the only possible answer to questions like that, which is, do you think Hamlet is real? <laughs> I mean, I, like, what are you talking about? You know, and of course, of course, I get, as I said earlier, I get that, like, yes, there's a fictive reality, and if we embrace that, but what's interesting about it is that that fictive reality is challenged and, cr and crumbles and, con and is contradictory at every turn, at least if the play is good, <laughs> you know? Um, and that's, th so that's sort of what's inspiring to me in terms of making stuff. Uh, for me, I, I'm really interested in perception, and um, I think that what you see and what you think is real uh, really depends on where you're looking from. And I think that has a lot to do with um, issues of class and culture and all sorts of things. Um, and so I think it's hard to say, uh, to, to delimit what's real and what isn't. Um, because I come and look at things, uh, I come from and look at things with a certain, from a certain perspective. There was a production called Z is for Dog that I think was in New York for a while, but it started in LA a few years ago and it was this like beautiful 50s style house with the housewife making breakfast for her kids. Um, and the food was all fake. You know, they'd put like a plastic pancake on the plate and she'd pretend to turn on the water and like they'd act like there was water. And about halfway through the play, it's revealed that they're actually all living in an underground bunker and that there had been, you know, like this nuclear explosion that they're all under. And the, the wife picks up a plastic pancake and has been like, we've been acting like these are real pancakes. You know, there's no food here and there's no water. And they're getting all their, you know, vitamins from like these pills that they're taking. Um, and it was just a moment that has always really stuck out to me because as an audience member, you're, uh, you're, you so buy into the way that their fake their fake food is real food to you. And to have the actors stop and go, you know, no, this is fake, was just this incredibly, like, exil I mean, I'm getting, like, goosebumps. It was a really good play. Um, but this idea of playing with that reality, um, because it is all real, and, you know, it's, it's real to us and it's real to the actors, but to, to play with that line, um, I think, is really exciting. Um, my thought, I write a lot of kind of magical realism, so worlds that are very much not meant to be real. Um, the play I'm working on right now, it's kind of what happens after Twelfth Night, um, and it's actually a climate change play. So Twelfth Night, it's floods and waves and tsunamis, and they're on this little island, um, and the, the, the island worships the moon, who in our production is a pole dancer, because we have a great pole dancer in our class. Um, so she's spinning up as the moon the whole time, and then the moon decides to just leave everybody and abandon everyone. And we talk a lot about, like, well, is this real? Is this symbolic? I mean, are we thinking this is a real place? And I would say the same thing as David, which is, to me, it is all real, and it has to be real. But the idea that this reality is so different from the day-to-day -day reality is what I think allows the message to be projected in a way that really you know, is more impactful. I kind of talk about a lot with my work, like the deeper you go, I think the better your jokes have to be. Like if it's gonna be really dark and you're really being, you know, either political or even just darkly emotional, you have to balance that out a little bit. And I think with some of my own work, I've noticed it's easier to not push an agenda, but to at least reveal a line of thinking that you're, you're excited to explore with an audience by adding elements that are more fantastic, that allows it to be accessible, oddly. Well, I, I think about the older George Bush going to buy socks in a supermarket and he didn't have money. Like he didn't know, he never carried money. That's a different reality than mine. <laughs> you know, not that I carry a lot of money. <laughs> so, good. Um, Think about those guys, Piscator, obviously Brecht. Uh, if I'm correct, didn't he have a train ticket in his pocket on opening night for a three-penny opera? And he always sat in the back. And depending on how bad the reaction was, <laughs> he was heading to get on the first, plane, the first train out. Um, 
But, you know, he put his work together in one way or another, you know, facing uh, <laughs> beyond recession, right, depression in Germany, uh, <laughs> brown shirts, uh, black boots, all that stuff. Uh, politics and more than that. Uh, one might say we're approaching moments where we have a lot facing us as artists and we have a response that we can give. And I think to some extent, some of the aspects of epic theater are ways of responding. How are you responding right now? I mean, just say it, just say Trump, say Trump. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to Trump? How do you respond to a moment, a fractious moment? How do you respond to an audience who perhaps in one way or another, you know, I don't know, might scare you? Uh, Martha Wilson says if he's elected, she's going to perform as Trump. And I think that is something to look forward to. But um, another thing uh, that my husband has pointed out uh, is that comics say that it's hard to deal with Trump because he is ahead of them. <laughs> it's hard to imagine something more outrageous than he actually will say. Um, I'm not sure, I, I first of all hope that we don't have to deal with it beyond the election. And if we do, I'm sure we'll all in this room be thinking of ways to deal with it. I don't have plans right now. I, d I, I, um, I mean, I can say two things about this. Um, you know, the work that I do doesn't address issues in, a, in an explicit way like this. I just find that uninteresting. But I hope, I always aspire to make work that is so deeply engaged with its context, locally and in the larger sphere, that those issues are present vividly, are built into it. I, it's just, I, I'm never going to make a, a piece of work, I don't think, where somebody says, D you know, t n n t says a bunch of stuff about an election, or explicitly, or directly. Maybe famous last words, right? Um, I will say, you know, what, what troubles me about Donald Trump is less Donald Trump than us. <laughs> yeah. um, what troubles me is, let's say Donald Trump loses the election. This is not going to go away. Yeah. I mean, what's, what is manifesting are things in this culture that are so, I mean, I think everybody in this room, we can all pat ourselves on the back for <coughs> agreeing, for feeling this way, I guess. Or if not, speak up. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you dare, but um, but I mean, th it's the situation just seems so horrifying to me, and just like day by day, um, th this morning, it, it, you know, you wake up and there's more stuff about things that just, I, it, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to get off track, but it w my hope would be that the work that I'm making is going to express meaningful stuff about us and what is what is sick or troubled in this community or, or culture that we're in, and try in some way to to break those things open and in that way address them meaningfully. Uh, one thing years ago I wrote a play called um, Isabella Dreams a New World in which she's married to a man who I based on David Duke who went to LSU where I went to school. I knew him. Um, and the things that I have him say people thought were exaggerated but they're all being said now, the thing about Trump that's distressing is that he says what so many people want to say. And now that he's said it, it's given permission for more people to be outspoken about what they think, those who are on the edges. Um, now that he has people beaten up, it's OK to beat up people who you don't agree with. Um, because he's running for president after all. So I think those things we are going to be living with for years to come. Um, and I think we really will have to address it, um, maybe not explicitly directly in the theater, but we'll have to come up with some strategies for engaging communities. I think um, specifically as a black playwright, a lot of the instances that we're talking about now have been happening in my community for such a long time. And in it's now at this bubble where it's happening to people who are not of color. So um, the play that I am working on for the Tumblers has to deal with that. Like this reality is something that started much further back than Trump. We're just dealing with 
something that's now been pushed to the level where there are actually white people who are getting beat up and now it's a huge, huge deal, but I think it's always great to deal with a story like this and go back as, as far as you can because just because you're now aware of it doesn't necessarily mean that that mentality didn't exist before. And so that's why we use theater to be able to write pieces or do projects that, um, you know, like Lisa Gamora was talking about earlier for her piece in, in Milton and all the five Miltons. There are these issues that, that have existed for generations and we're not done talking about them um, because we never really address them. We never sort of put it out on the table. I was listening to Courtney Vance talk about uh, doing the O.J. Simpson um, piece that he's on now, and he was saying that he and Tony Goldwyn were working on a, a, a pl uh, sort of a show together. And so when the O.J. announcement happened, they were rooming together in an apartment, and they did the, they did the, um, the announcement of whether he was guilty or not, and Courtney's like, yes! And Tony's like, no! <laughs> and then they looked at each other like, oh shit, you have an entirely different idea of what this instance is. And they talked about why they were coming at it from two different things, but they both assumed that they were on the same page, right? And, you know, he talked about, you know, the history of black people and being, you know, sort of uh, prosecuted. And Tony talked about, like, you know, um, d domestic violence. But that was such a valuable time, t Courtney said, that we didn't continue this conversation. We put it under the rug. And so now we're stepping on the rug and all this stuff is coming back up again. If you keep sweeping things under the rug, then you step on the rug, all the dust comes back up anyway. And so we keep dealing with these kinds of things. And so that's why I think, you know, when we talk about these realities, they're not brand new. We're just now figuring out ways to make them so relevant that everyone is still is thinking about them in new ways and having the conversation with other people without like, you know, of course you assume what I think. You're like, of course you hate Trump. There are people who don't, you know. I'm afraid to meet them, but like, no, they, I mean, I didn't <laughs> click on that little link on Facebook that says, who are your friends who like Trump? I'm like, no, I don't think we should do that right now. <laughs> I would, I mean, just to kind of piggyback on that a little bit, I think that theater in particular out of a lot of, you know, all available art forms has um, the opportunity for really empathetic, you know, mission. Partially because it's really people in the room, I think, that there there is a sense of like you're in the room with the other people watching. The people who are who are making the story are in the room with you. Um, and I think that's something that's really important, you know, as as a political person and someone who does have a lot of very you know, passionate, specific beliefs. I think as a writer, it's really important to use theater, you know, to explore all different perspectives. And I think that, you know, trying to write a play, you know, like let's say you did want to write an anti-Trump play. I think the first order of business would be to talk to a lot of people who did really love Trump to like, to really try to understand, because I think, you know, as was said earlier, you know, it's not Trump. It's what's created this space culturally. And it's, you know, how we got to this point. And I think that, you know, looking at a world that, you know, you're going into, you know, looking into the future and saying, okay, there could be some rough times ahead, exploring every possible viewpoint and treating every viewpoint with empathy, even things that you are horribly offended by or hurt by, um, is a is a way to more accurately engage the world with your, and not to alienate people with your own thoughts. Mm -hmm. Gotta agree with you. Right, exactly. I wanna piggyback on the um, idea of empathy because like at the, at the most basic, um, we are all human. And so I try to, in some of my plays, have those characters, like not necessarily David Duke, but <laughs> um, you know, characters uh, th whose politics I'm diametrically opposed to and um, really struggle with not being didactic about it because I think the first thing, once once you present something in a didactic way, that's the first way to shut things down. Unless unless it's using strategies that you know are, are kind of working in concert with each other to you know kind of be more Brechtian and bring attention in that way. Um, but that's not really didactic. So never mind. Um, 
but in order to yeah understand these scary people that are, are not only limiting um did i say scary people yes, you did. okay <laughs> these people um <laughs> who are part of our this country um i think it's also important to draw connections with things that are happening in other parts of the world. I mean, sure, this is very specifically a US thing that's happening, um, but I just think of, I don't know, the word, the word like evil comes to mind um, as an idea to explore and how that pops up and how easy it can be to be complicit in movements toward that. Um, and using very, very simple stories, like human stories on stage, um, seems like a really good place to start. I'm kind of conflicted because I don't think, I don't, I don't believe in the word evil. <laughs> I think it's too used. I don't really think empathy is necess always necessary. I don't think didactic is necessary. I think Tony Kushner's didactic in Angels in America, which is a really powerful play on the zeitgeist. If only there were <laughs> another such play right now um, that, that could talk about the big issues in the culture all at once. Um, it's, it's a different time. And I, don't, I haven't read the person who has the insight into the whole picture uh, as much right now. But I don't think we have to always be empathetic to our characters. Um, and I think that uh, we don't always have to, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just stop right now. Uh, but in terms of, I just want to say in terms of time, I think it's very valuable to have uh, ranges of time in your play to suddenly go from one year to another year, a <laughs> hundred years before, um, to have a break where people change costumes and all of a sudden they're different. Uh, I think those things, uh, a lot of the techniques we got from Brecht are really uh, still enormously useful. Super. We want to hear from you, and we're gonna, but just maybe quickly, if you might. I'm going to try to add to the definition in a contemporary way. This is something, when I think about epic, what I would include that is of my own. I like to I, I, I like teach with it, and I like to think about it when I'm writing uh, rhyme, uh, history and mystery. And I think about history as fact, the data, the stuff that's occurred. <coughs> and then I think about mystery, and I don't know how you define it, but I consider it the unknown, not necessarily the unknowable, but stuff that maybe we have yet to find out. And I try to balance those in the work uh, and push myself as much as possible. I think there's a history mystery uh, that can work very well in the world of epic theater in the present moment. That's me. So I ask each of you if maybe you'd like to add to the definition of epic theater or if you'd like to talk about history and mystery for you, however you wish. Well, I think, um, I was talking to Vasanti about this earlier, I think history is also something that's subjective, right? Like, a lot of people have a very different idea of a very historical fact, depending on who witnessed what, there are always different stories. So I think when you do history mystery, um, mystery is already built into the history, and I like, as a uh, playwright, to explore that sweet spot. I'll, I'll try to take something um, historical, um, I did, write a play um, about, uh, called uh, Indigos, about a, um, the wife of a jazz musician in the 60s, um, who, uh, like I was thinking about what do black women do in the 60s who were married to a semi-famous jazz musician, because there weren't a lot of opportunities when you're like teaching, or do you, you know, what's this thing that we it's, uh, identify with culturally and socially, um, class-wise, uh, you still experience racism, um, so doing a lot of research about, because I'm a Coltrane fan, about facts that happened when you read a, different, a bunch of different stories about a factual thing like Coltrane's um, addiction. You read Coltrane's version and then you read Miles' version and you're like, there are two different things that happened here. And there's a sweet spot in here where we can weave in 
sort of a fiction that we hope will engage the audience and play with reality and time at the same time. So I, I think the history and mystery is, is, is um, something that's amazing to watch on stage, you know? Well, I did research on Sarah Bernhardt for a solo called Sarah Bernhardt Meets Her Waterloo. And um, that was very enriching, and there were a lot of parallels, actually, except I hadn't lost my left leg. Um, but I also have done work on um, 100 years ago farming in the Midwest uh, uh, using Molly Cather's work as research and then interviewing uh, farmers out there. Um, and I think that history and, and Isabella, the play I talked about before, s I started with uh, Columbus's notebooks about coming to the New World because economics was a big factor in why they came here. Um, money is at the root of all problems American. Um, so I think that uh, history does yield great material and I agree with Fornes that every play should have mystery in it. Um, so I never thought of the two of history as being a mystery, but I think mystery and history both can yield something for a new play. I um, last year was working on a musical about Emma Goldman, um, and it was really interesting to do research on Emma Goldman because she has a very public face and then a very private face. Um, and so getting to go through you know, these amazing, incredible speeches of hers and interviews that she would give, um, where I mean, she would say things like, you know, I wanna kill all the policemen, like things that are like, wow, like I can't believe that you said that at any time in history. But then you'd go to her you know, diaries and it was like, you know, why didn't my boyfriend call me? Like it was this <laughs> totally different person. Um, and the idea of history and mystery that even a person's own history is mysterious and a person's own story is different depending on you know, the decisions that they're, you know, where they're coming from that day. And I know personally I feel that a lot where it's like I have you know, eight different versions of a single story. That's my own story that I was present for. Um, and so then looking at, you know, historical documents and looking at, you know, who, who gets to tell the story and who had access to the tools to make that story history. Right. And, you know, looking at like the depths of that, I mean, I think it's all a mystery. And that's what's really fun about writing something that does have some historical basis because you do get to pick and choose the narrative that kind of creates, you know, the part of it that you're interested in and the part of it that you're telling. And there's also like how much history has been rewritten or um, um, again, depending on who you know is doing the writing. So that part is, is <coughs> what kind of fascinates me as well. Um, like which, which is, what's the true version and is there a way to ever know and is it important to, um, how important is it, it's important to know what's true, but how do you get there? And if you're dealing with a historical um, situation, uh, how important is it to make the unknown part of the story, I think, you know, to question. Yeah, and, yeah, and it seems like this is also where we approach the, the, the um, way in which theater becomes like quantum physics, right? W which is to say that those competing histories not only are competing fascinating histories, they actually coexist at the same time, yeah. right? That particle is there and there. Yeah. <laughs> now, 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 you know. Um, that's <laughs> exciting um, <laughs> to me. Uh, yeah, and um, uh, so when it comes to history specifically, I mean, I think of this because I've been working on um, a play by Eugene O'Neill, a trilogy called Morning Becomes Electra that I'm sure you know, and is very much a document of American history and its barbarism. And so folding that into the reality that we create on stage is something that's very alive in my mind, and I'm, I'm very animated by these days. And, uh, you know, thinking, you know, the past isn't dead, it isn't even past, right? right? Totally. I mean, 
that that's just the way it is, and that's so exciting. Or there's always that question about like, well, what period does the play happen in? And to me, they're always at the same time, you know, at least three answers to that right. question and really more. But the three obvious ones are the, the period when the play is set. Okay, if it's Morning Becomes Electra, then it's the 1865. And there's the period when the author wrote it, right, right 1931. And then, of course, period it's set, and it's happening now, obviously. <laughs> tonight. It's happening tonight. When else would it happen? Um, and then, of course, other answers, too. Talk about playing with time. You ever been talking with a play about this kind of time? So if you're going to uh, hopefully speak to this play, you need to ask the question, what is this play about? What does it do? Um, what time is it? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to talk for three to five minutes about spectatorship while we switch over to the next panel. Um, so at the New Rican Poets Cafe, we were lucky enough to host uh, No Passport during, how long ago? Was it three years ago, two years ago? Yeah, we had a fantastic uh, No Passport conference. So um, one of the things I want to mention about spectatorship, at the New Rican Poets Cafe, our audience base and our arti artist base tends to be uh, largely people of color under the age of 30, which is fairly unusual for a nonprofit arts organization in New York or anywhere else in this country. And I'll tell you, one of the reasons I think that our audience base and our artist base are so much younger and more diverse than that of most other arts organizations, and that's because our events are very participatory, very crowdsourced. And that's obviously true of an open mic or a poetry slam, but it's also true of the theater that we do, much of which is solo theater, much of which does away with the fourth wall, and much of which grows out of the spoken word movement. Artists like Sarah Jones and Craig Mums Grant, who take slam poetry and spoken word tropes and develop them into solo theater. And what we found is that the more engaging a work of theater is, the more that a solo performer or any theatrical writer and performer can engage their audience in a two-way communication. The more those works tend to appeal to a younger audience and the easier it is to market them and to draw in untraditional, youthful and diverse audiences. And we've also found that artists who come up through the spoken word gauntlet and who have experience being on stage doing immediate um, relevant and direct performances in a slam or open mic context are often able to command the attention of an audience anywhere and in any context. And we've seen a lot of artists who start out in slam poetry or spoken word uh, settings who go on to tremendous success as theater artists elsewhere. I think that, and it's interesting, when we do plays, musicals that have more of a traditional fourth wall, that have more of a traditional relationship between artists and audience. In many cases, the audiences for those shows tend to be older, tend to be more homogenous, and tend to be a lot more like the audiences that you'll see at other nonprofits and other arts venues um, around the city and around the country. But the skills that someone can develop as a spoken word artist and the skills that um, slam poetry and spoken word nurture 
I think those translate well into theater in any context. And we also see a lot of overlap between the artists and audiences who frequent spoken word, slam poetry, and open mic events, and people who frequent protest events. And I think there's a lot of there's a lot of relevance to the immediacy, the directness, and the almost confrontational nature of solo theater that translates well into socially relevant movements um, and into protests like the one that shut down the Trump uh, event in Chicago recently, which we're privately very proud of. Um, in any case, so if you haven't been to a Poetry Slam or Open Mic recently or any of our events at the New Yorkan Poets Cafe, I'd encourage you to check one out with an eye towards theater as well as an eye towards poetry and an eye towards audience engagement and political relevance and immediacy as well as towards poetry. Because in many cases we see that relationship between solo artist and audience translating into theatrical work that transcends traditional audience definitions and transcends some of the boundaries that tend to make theater experiences elsewhere more homogenous and more limited. Uh, anyway, and I couldn't be more happy to be celebrating the 10th anniversary of No Passport. So thank you all for being here, and thank you, Caridad. Uh, we're moving into our next session, uh, and then after that there will be a wine and cheese break, I'm told, um, which uh, the next session is Cultural Appropriation. It's moderated by Saviana Stanescu. Uh, there's also a component of it. Uh, one of the panelists is on Skype, and it's Chris Diaz, so we're, we're going to need to uh, figure all that out. I'll hand it over to Saviana. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming, for staying, and for being here with us. Chris Diaz is going to join us from right the cyberspace. <laughs> and his family obligations. Come, come. Okay. Is Chris with us? So while people are sitting down, I'm just going to introduce briefly the, the panelists, um, and then they will, of course, talk about their work and uh, will uh, start the conversation. So we have uh, Kyung Park, we have Isa Fatima, Geoffrey Jackson Scott, and Jeff Janiszewski, all right? Okay, trying to pronounce okay, all uh, the names well. Chris, can we have you talk? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Chris Diaz is here with us. Hi, everybody. See you here. Okay, good. Um, first of all, I was really happy to see that quite a few panelists before us engaged with our main question, who's telling whose story? So it's really great for us to finally focus a little bit um, around these issues. And I'm going to start with a comment and a provocation and, of course, questions for our panelists. Um, as um, many sociologists um, stated, our identities are shaped by the stories we tell and the stories we are told since childhood. Um, that being said, in terms of the arts and particularly theater and drama, um, arguably, although I would say uh, it's really true, um, the main narrative, the mainstream narrative, um, the main stories that had relevance globally have been told from a Western European, white, straight, <laughs> male perspective for centuries. And while, of course, I don't want to villainize um, those particular uh, playwrights or theater artists, I do think that this is an important question that we need to ask ourselves as contemporary artists in a world in which people are starting to question the white color dichotomy and we are talking about the white privilege and who's telling whose story, of course. Uh, also, in a sort of larger global context, I think we also shape the conversation around issues of um, intersectionality, the intersections between uh, gender, class, uh, uh, sexuality, uh, racial issues, and of course other type of privileges. And as a Romanian-born artist, of course I am aware of the main issues that shape the global conversation in terms of the powerful countries, big countries, and their power to tell the stories 
of people from smaller countries, from poor countries. Uh, for instance, to start with my own country, everybody knows of Dracula and that gloomy place called Transylvania, which is actually a beautiful region of Romania that I invite you all to visit. But, you know, Dracula is looming <laughs> around, you know, <laughs> all of us. So, uh, starting with that, um, I would really like to ask our panelists and Chris um, over there, what do you guys think we can do as contemporary artists and what you have been doing in your own work to challenge this mainstream uh, narrative, this mainstream way of telling the story. I'm not saying it's not a valid one, but I do believe that we need to diversify the perspectives and the voices that tell stories, so we don't only hear one perspective or just one category's perspective, but we get to hear stories told from different perspectives, personal perspectives, uh, different um, context and subtext <laughs> and pretext than the main white Western European narrative. I'm making that distinction because I know that we from poor Eastern European countries had also deal, had also have to deal with the privilege of Western powers. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Kyung. Uh, there are a lot of questions posed, so I'll try to be brief. <laughs> um, so I, I'm having a total, I think this is the conversation where we're talking about race without necessarily talking about race, but I would like to talk about race um, because the way you speak about the Eurocentrism of, of, of cultural institutions like the theater, I think um, are manifest and have been made very clear in the discussions about racial and cultural equity um, whether it's on Broadway or in downtown stages in New York City or in the visual arts world or in films. So in every cultural manifestation of any discipline, we are seeing this overwhelming whiteness and we need to address this head on. Um, I think in terms of cultural appropriation, we come from a history where we have borrowed each other's stories to tell new stories since the beginning of theater. So to deny cultural appropriation as if it wasn't part of our practice is a lie. We all do it and I do it. So when I speak about racism in theater, I wanna speak from a place of complicity as well because I am guilty of what we do as professionals. Um, I think though, uh, the lack of diversity and this overwhelming whiteness points towards other conversations we have in social justice circles about uh, white power, white supremacy, and the way racism, orientalism, and genocide are part of the histories of America which are not reflected on American stages when we think of white culture or American culture. I think a lot of this own history has been swept under the rug so when cultural appropriation happens and people of color are displaced from their histories and narratives and put into this other idyllic sort of like white narrative, um, it's unfair and it's insulting and it denies not only our histories but hides the crimes of our complicity in American society. So I think that really resonates with me as the, as the reason why cultural appropriation is so polemical right now. Um, and I have more to say, but I'll stop there. Aiza? Yeah, um, for me, you guys, um, so I'm a female, I'm South Asian, I grew up in the Middle East, I and my parents are from Pakistan. I consider that the Middle East, a lot of people don't. Um, and um, you know, I'm also Muslim American, and I, I think there's a lot of intersections there. And I find for Muslim Americans right now, as you know, it is a problem in this country and abroad. I just came back from the UK a few days ago, four days ago, um, and uh, I have a solo show that I've per been performing all over the world, and I was performing it there. And, um, and I find it's really interesting. The conversation has really shifted. This is the fourth time I've been in the UK, including the Edinburgh Fringe from 2012. And it's really different now performing this play there um, where people are aware of um, immigration, the hyphenated identity, um, you know, and what's going on. Everybody knows Trump in the UK, from the taxi drivers to, you know, uh, people everywhere, from in theater, outside of theater. Um, and 
I think in terms of who's telling whose story, you know, it's the onus is on us. If you are a non-white person of any kind of color, it's on you to tell that story. Because in the absence of you telling your own story, other people will tell it for you. And it will be colored in the way that they see it. I struggle with this on a daily basis. I'm an actor and a writer. And you know, th theater may be a closed shop, and theater may be difficult, and we might have issues. It's, um, it's I feel like the issues are pronounced tenfold in, in film and uh, TV, where I've been on sets with all white people, and they have no clue what a Muslim looks like, and if I've been cast, it's like a woman with an accent who covers her hair. W why? <laughs> you know, because Americans, Muslim Americans I know don't look like that, or don't, you know. So that's a whole other, I mean, sorry, I have a lot to say as well, but I'll stop. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there are so many things I could say, um, but I'll begin uh, by also revealing my situatedness, so all the things that I am. Uh, so I'm black, I'm gay, I'm from a very small town in the middle west of this country. Um, I grew up across the street from the projects, uh, and many years after all those things, my dad was in the military and we started moving around, so I lived in the south, I lived in Alaska, uh, and then eventually when I moved away to places on my own, I came here to New York. I worked at a place that I will name. I worked at New York Theatre Workshop. I worked there for about seven and a half years uh, supporting new play development. Um, and part of your question, Saviana, is what are the things that we are doing to deal with cultural appropriation? So one of the things that I did there um, is I ran the Artist of Color Fellowship, which did exist. Now it has a different name and it has a slightly different um, architecture and goal, but at that point it was specifically focused around um, mentoring and providing space in the field for emerging artists of color. Uh, so I was there for seven and a half years, and then I went to uh, Victory Gardens Theatre in Chicago where I was the head of uh, new play development there. Now I no longer work inside the institution, I work outside. Uh, I'm a communications and engagement strategy consultant working with artists and theaters on audience engagement and audience development. So those are all the different spaces that I occupy. The reason I lay all of those out is because I have occupied different seats in a conversation about appropriation. Um, I can say that in the, um, in the rarefied air of the inside of theater buildings, uh, when you are one of, if not the only face, says, of color, you are called upon to be an authority. You are called upon to um, to uh, to verify the authenticity of, of, of one's experience. Uh, and I found many, many, many times uh, in, my, in my history that plays would move into the building, they would be really interesting, telling what for me was a very nuanced story about people, other, what, whoever those people were. Um, a really nuanced picture of, uh, of people was being told, and then you'd bring that piece forward and in particular for me, when those pieces were written by, uh, by, by black playwrights, um, I would get into these very interesting conversations about, but I mean, is this like really authentic? Like, I mean, is this really how people talk? Like, tell us. It's like, I mean, I can actually only speak to how people talk, black people talk, really, from my town, my community, my family, unless I start to reach for how black people are portrayed in <laughs> the media writ large. Um, so for me, that's one of the dangers of appropriation when things are adopted or borrowed or used, whichever of those terms we lean on. To what use are those things, those elements from other cultures being put, and what is the danger? The danger is all the space is taken up, and then you are this one thing. It is only possible for you to be that, and when some other voice comes through to try and show that there's actually a nuance in this community or that community, these things are not um, celebrated, supported, produced. Jeff, shall we go to Chris? Chris, do you have an answer, a first <laughs> answer to this complicated question? Yeah, it's super, it's super complicated. Um, thank you for, for, for turning it over for a second. Um, I'll try to go quick. So yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think I, I agree with the larger question of sort of tell your own story. And I mean, um, you know, I, I don't know any other way to write or to create than to tell something that's really specific to who I am. Um, and, um, you know, I've been, I've been fortunate to have a little bit of success with telling my own story. And that, I think, leads to the second part of it. And I'm going to curse, so I, I apologize in advance. But um, 
uh, I forget who has the who 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 I'm quoting here, but the concept of fuck you money. Um, you don't want to have just money, but you have that that kind of fuck you money. And I think like uh, to be in a position, I'm fortunate to be in a position where the first play that I that the first couple of plays that I wrote gave me a little bit of fuck you capital because they were built on this energy, not about being anti-institution or tearing down institutions, but that I was going to sort of tell stories the way that I wanted to tell them in the context that I wanted to, privilege the kinds of things that I wanted to, the kinds of characters who uh, existed in my life. And, you know, I'm, I'm a Puerto Rican kid from a Jewish suburb, married to a Filipino woman. We have no idea what that makes our son. Like, literally, we don't know what that is on the census, um, our sons. So, so I carry that with me. And I think that ability to, to carry that with you once you get into these institutional spaces, um, the, 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 to, to be fortunate enough to have that privilege, which is its own sense of privilege, gives you a sense of responsibility now. So uh, when you get into that room, it's important to be in the next room. It's important to be in the rooms that give out awards, for example. It's important to be at, at, at rooms that invite people into institutions of higher learning. Not that you're going to get on those panels and you're going to say, you know who deserved this award? Uh, you know, we just gave an award at, the, at Columbia, the Kennedy Award for American history. We gave that award to, to I mean, big surprise, we gave it to Lynn manuel for Hamilton, but not because Lynn is another Puerto Rican dude, because that is a play that really deserved it. And we've given it in the past to Dominique Morisot. We've given it in the past to great works. But it's important to be able to be in those rooms and, you know, from that high level of awards all the way down to folks who are getting into NYU or folks that are getting into Juilliard, whatever those rooms might be, and not to privilege them because of necessarily what they are, but to understand and recognize the work that these folks are trying to do, the traditions in which they're writing, the context from which they come. Um, so I think it's really important that while you're telling your own story, you're also being supportive and understanding of folks telling stories across the board, whether that's race, ethnicity, religion, gender, whatever the sort of, you know, diversity questions might be. Uh, but if, if you ask people to cast the net wide for wide enough to fit you, you have to make sure that that net is now being cast wide enough for whoever's coming next. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Jeff? Um, so, yeah, the issue uh, that you're raising, Savion, of, of what our culture is and what we, I love that phrase of I carry that with me. So what do I carry with me? What do all of us carry with uh, with us, um, my f um, I'm a teacher and, and I um, I run theater programs. I just came from Australia. I was running a theater school there, an acting program. My dad is a was a butcher. Uh, at a uh, had a butcher shop in Passaic, New Jersey, and very blue collar family. And I carry that with me. I carry that sense of of class, of economics, of uh, watching him struggle and watching the other people, the other Russian and Czechoslovakian and Polish people meet and hang out all day in his butcher shop at, while I was working there on the weekends and tell stories. And that was my introduction to theater, was being in that butcher shop and, and that very literally bloody, sweaty um, butcher shop and hearing people tell stories. And so in terms of what I, um, the thing that I'm bringing into my theater is issues of class, economics, but also human dramas. In terms of what I'm trying to change, it, to that, that provocation that Saviana has, uh, running a theater school, running an acting program, what I'm trying to do is, is change well, no, a number of things, change the fabric of who gets into the program, who the teachers are, the canon of work we're doing, um, what notions of theater students have. So I'm trying to expand not only the diversity and fabric of the student body, but also the diversity of texts that we're working on and explode that notion of what a play can be. Uh, so at night, I was running a theater school at the National Institute of Dramatic Art in Sydney. When I began four years ago, it was an entirely white student body. By the time I left after four years, it was there were five actors of color, three in international students, um, and two-thirds of the students were second or third uh, generation immigrant families from Australia. So it became a more representative of the national fabric of Australia. That was very important to me. At the same time, they were the best actors I could let into that program. Um, so uh, lots of issues and lots of provocations. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, that's why I wanted to open our discussion with the uh, context of intersections, class, race, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, but move it towards uh, 
more specificity for each of us. So now I really like to ask you, uh, ask each of you, uh, what is cultural appropriation for you? Have you experienced it in your work or in any other ways? And this, uh, uh, you might frame the conversation in terms of personal feelings and personal work. Then we're gonna move it to maybe more public uh, controversies like the Mikado or what happened to Katori Hall's mountaintop when a white um, actor was cast uh, as Martin Luther King or Lloyd Sue's play when uh, non-white actors, when uh, white actors were cast in non-white roles. So I like to start with the personal, the personal is political of course, and then uh, try to move into these larger conversations. So what is cultural appropriation for you? Have you experienced it? Give us the facts. <laughs> Um, I, I have a hard time answering that question because I've experienced the opposite. Um, I've been told as a gay Korean Chilean immigrant playwright, there is no way my story can be told on stage because there will be no audience to identify with it. So there's no universality for it. So no one wanted to appropriate my story. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <laughs> I had to tell my own story, start my own theater company and find my own audience and build my own communities and that is uh, the opposite of cultural appropriation. Um, I don't know what that's called. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> that's basically tell your own story. And the problem with that is that as an artist of color, it is very important for us to tell our own stories. That is how uh, we begin to find our voice. But um, I'm really uh, struck by this quote that uh, Lynn Nottage uh, uh, said uh, about her play Sweat, where artists of color are allowed to tell stories of their experiences as people of color and the stories of their communities of color. But playwrights of color do not get to talk about the state of the union kind of plays, you know, where we really talk about the grander metaphors, you know, of who we are as a nation, which is why Hamilton is kind of incredible. And the thing is, um, uh, if we are going to really tackle, you know, the problems of the mainstream only reflecting white male experiences. We need to also empower voices like ours to speak beyond our personal experiences to really talk about wh who we are as a nation. And in America, I feel like what is also happening is that this narrative is no longer about the white male American, which is why also we see a lot of people like Trump's followers getting really mad because the history of America is not also including them, even though they thought it belonged to them. And it is now the history of global capitalism and its destruction of the earth. And where are we on that story and how are we as people of color complicit in that narrative? So that's my question. Well, thank you, <laughs> thank you. That was awesome. Um, <laughs> So I can kind of relate to that. Um, just so when I started doing my show, it's almost been like five years now this summer, I was told the exact same stuff by a lot of people. Um, you won't get an audience. Nobody really cares about solo work. I, in fact, like I met with a Broadway producer, <laughs> and she's done really well. She's producing on Broadway still. And she was like, oh, honey, you know, nobody, uh, solo shows about your life. Nobody really cares. And it's so funny, she hadn't even read it. My show is not about my life. It's actually based on interviews I conducted in the New York, New Jersey area with a lot of people. And uh, I play a range of like six-year-old to a 65-year-old old woman, none of them are me. Um, and so it was really interesting, a lot of no's until I went out and got my own audience and did it and the play has toured all over the world and it sells out almost always wherever we've taken it. So like, you know, you have to kind of prove yourself first. So I've been there and I don't know what that's called either. And then I've also been on the other side of things, you know, where um, other people are telling the story for you and uh, it's, it's very frustrating. I don't have an answer. I think we do have to engage, we do. I mean, I'm currently um, consulting as a Muslim American consultant um, on a play um, and it's uh, white playwrights and it's through a grant and I get it because this theater has always worked with these people. So, you know, they brought them over and they needed a consultant. It's at least a step in the right direction. I, I wish that they had actually gotten some of the Muslim American playwrights to contribute to the play as writers and not just as. So, you know, it's frustrating having these conversations with people and it's like, you know, oh, what if this girl wears a hijab and she has a conflict with her father and her brother? I was like, why? You know, again, like showing the Muslim male as an evil, 
it's it's very frustrating because I'm constantly fighting to show the opposite of that, which is what I grew up with. My father is the biggest feminist I know, and he's a Muslim man um, who also comes from nothing and was you know one of uh, eight kids and the only one to go past like sixth grade level education. Um, you know, so I it's important to tell those stories. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, sorry, I'm like going on and on <laughs> again. <laughs> I find like I have a lot to say about this because it's it is very it is very frustrating because other people tell and even within this kind of um, cross section of being Muslim American, I think there's a misunderstanding uh, that you know a lot of Muslims are Arab when in fact I think uh, ninety percent of the world's population that's Muslim is non-Arab. Um, you know, and who's to and there are more Muslims in India than there are in Pakistan, and and so who's telling those stories? Um, yeah, there are also Muslim Bosnians and uh, and Muslim Puerto Turkish. Rican Caribbeans who I've met here who are you know so yeah absolutely there's this there's this huge uh, kind of um, not under misunderstanding of of what that looks like, and I remember early on when I was first. There's a character in my play who covers her hair, who talks a little bit like a valley girl, and that was very important for me to show because it's based on somebody very real who I know. And I remember there was a interviewer from backstage who was really into us, into the play. You know, she was very supportive, but she sat through a rehearsal, and at the end of the rehearsal, white woman, she goes. Well, but you know that character with the covers her hair? I mean, if somebody covers their hair, they really wouldn't talk that way. <laughs> I mean, I hear things like that all the time. If, like, you do X, then you couldn't be Y, you know? And it's just this, uh, I, it's frustrating. It's, it's like we have to fix this, and we have to keep telling the stories, and we, we need many more voices, especially from the Muslim American community, uh, you know, to, to tell those stories. Yeah, I love it when people tell you about your own culture and ethnicity, and they know better. Oh, <laughs> I've been I've been asked in an audition uh, to do an Indian accent, and then told how to do it by a white person. So, you know, I mean, I could tell you so many stories, but yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, thinking about the question, I, I have so many complicated, um, what feel to me like very complicated relationships with uh, with even the. the not with the phrase of cultural appropriation, but just different ways in. So one piece, when I was very young, I was studying to be a director, and I was going to Columbia College in Chicago, and it was my uh, graduate project, and I really wanted to direct The Glass Menagerie. I loved it. I had just a, a, a deep, deep, deep connection to the play. And I could feel at the moment of proposing, oh, I want to do this thing, I could feel the tension in the room. I couldn't quite identify why it was there, because I was younger and I wasn't so smart about the world, but I could feel it. Um, and because I was younger and not so smart, I asked, is there a problem with me directing the play? Um, and I worked with some very frank people on the, on the faculty, and they're like, well, actually, yeah, like, why don't you want to do Fences? Why don't you want to do... And it was when they started listing the plays that I realized, oh, damn, I totally... I, I believed for myself, at least in this program, that anything was possible. And you know, when you go through a program, you've been there for a long time, so this was now the end of a journey, and it's like, wow, you've actually always thought that for me, a certain set of things were possible. And I didn't believe that. So I had to struggle very hard to get to direct that production, and then I did, and by the end of it, oh wow, you really had something to bring to that. It's like, well, of course, <laughs> of course. And uh, what I had to end up saying, actually, um, which was very complicated, but I had to sort of disavow I was put in a position where I had to disavow sort of all of black theater. I'm like, I don't have anything to bring to that, or at least nothing that you haven't seen before, because a lot of those experiences in those plays, don't they don't resonate for me. That's just real. So I didn't, I just didn't have anything to bring to, s to Fences, for sure, God bless it, but I just didn't have anything to bring to that. Um, so that's one piece. The other, when I think about how I was raised in my community and in my family, there's a kind of cultural, cultural appropriation that was promoted. There are ways you want to speak. There are places you want to go. Maybe you should go to the museum. And, not to and, and saying this is complicated because it suggests that these are things that belong to a, a majority. I'll be very, I'll be very kind. Uh, <laughs> but it was definitely a part of my my background, my childhood. So when I hear contemporary folk um, say things like, pull your pants up and da-da-da, like those things, I, I hear those with a kind of 
suggestion that you must appropriate the ways of being and speaking um, of other. Yeah, tha that's a yeah. great point. And also, the exactly, like the other extreme is when you are asked to represent the right. whole right. culture, race, right. or ethnicity. Right. Like, you know, we are all one. Uh, Chris, do you have uh, uh, something? I, I have something, I guess. Um, <laughs> it, it, yeah, th this is great. It's it's These are such huge topics. The, um, I mean, I guess, okay, so two things. So personal story, uh, I'm looking at notes. I wrote down notes. That's why I'm looking down. Um, uh, so personal story, I mean, I guess the only really sort of personal uh, applications I can think of is early on in my career, and I, I think it still happens to some degree, but, you know, when your work gets primarily sold as, you know, the Latino play for this year, or it gets primarily sold as the female play, or the whatever that is, and that becomes the main selling point, and often to the detriment of what the work itself is doing, bec becoming, accomplishing, I think, you you know, you start out having to have a slightly different conversation. You have to have this 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 primary conversation before you're allowed to go to this second conversation. And you know, you have a play on Broadway, I don't, but if someone, you know, one has a play on Broadway and the conversation becomes, I mean, it's happening right now, uh, although this is a good problem to have, like with Eclipse, right? So the, the conversation around Eclipse is the first all black female cat, or the first all female production, first all black, all these, these various firsts and things. And I'm dying to hear the conversation about Eclipse as a play good, bad, and different, like just be able to talk about the thing. So on some level, this cultural appropriate, this, this well-intentioned cultural appropriation can be really problematic where you don't get to view the piece on the terms of the piece and, and marketers or, or producers will sell it. They'll say, oh, we're gonna do the Latino play right now. Let's, we'll put it out to the world and then the Latinos will come. And I was in a theater, con a theater organization where they were holding a Cinco de Mayo, organi I think a Cinco de Mayo party and they had a salsa band. And I went over to the, to the artistic director and I was like, you know, uh, maybe not a great thing, maybe not the right match of ethnicities. And the art associate artistic director uh, of this organization said, our, our audience won't be able to tell the difference. Um, and so I was like, all right, fine. I don't need to be here anymore. But more importantly, you know, matching, being able to talk about what the thing actually is rather than the sort of qualifiers on the outside it can be sort of problematic. But hand in hand, I think with some of the stuff that was going said earlier, um, I think this also speaks to this need right now. I mean, we have a lot of playwrights and we have a lot of folks, people of color who are becoming actors and increasingly more and more, but we don't have is critics and journalists and administrators. And there are opportunities and spaces in those realms for folks to contribute to the conversation on those levels as well. So that when you go to see a work by a Muslim American female, that you're able to engage with the work on these secondary and tertiary levels and actually engage with the work um, on its own terms, you know, be able to understand all of the, the the signifiers, be able to understand all the references, but also be able to understand, you know, be able to place things in a slightly different context that's not uh, so subsumed by that mainstream that we talked about in the first place. Um, so I think you know, the, just these when, when appropriation often has to do with ignorance, and I don't use the term ignorance in as pejorative a way as it sometimes comes off. But just you know, folks who grew up in different perspectives, it's important that those perspectives be shared on all sides of the conversation. Thank you, Chris. Jeff? Uh, I love what you said, we need many more voices. And I, would, I, I wrote that down and underlined it. I love that. <laughs> and as an educator, teacher, and a producer, I totally believe that. And actually, that's really what I love about No Passport. So thank you, Caridad, for continuing this amazing um, conference because every time I come here, uh, you know, watch it or come, I learn about so many more voices, voices that I need to include in my canon and in my, um, you know, keep them close to my heart. So I want to read, you know, young your plays and read about your one woman show and, and you know, have my students do them in, in classes because we, they need, students need to expand their repertoire of the human heart and really learn about the, the wide, wide um, capacity uh, for the heart and, and hear different stories and embody different stories. In terms of a cultural appropriation, two things. Uh, as, again, as a teacher, uh, I have the ability to have students work on fences, a uh, black actor and a white actor, no, well, because uh, <laughs> well, you mentioned fences before. You mentioned fences before. Right. So, uh, that's why I'm mentioning it. 
Um, so, but you know, you didn't want to work on it. But I, I did want to work on it with my students. I, I did want to have um, a white actor and a black actor work on that because, well, it was actually right. Th those characters were right for them as people, and it expanded their um, their hearts. It really opened them up. And and actually, something that opened me up. I was reading um, Jeffrey's bl uh, a blog that you were in um, something a theater and oppression or something. Yeah, and uh, one of the questions for to you was, um, what is your attitude towards the police? And reading your answer to that really moved me deeply because, uh, again, I just recognized yet again, yet again, what privilege I have. Uh, you know, I, I won't speak for you in terms of what your answer was, but, uh, it, you know, I, I don't have that experience with the police. I don't. Um, I, I can't remember your exact words, the, the fear and, and the apprehension, and, and, and that reading that opened me up and made me realize, okay, I have to pull off the blinders. And as a teacher, that is what I have to do. I have to shut up, I have to listen, listen to students, listen to their experiences, and give them these profound texts to push against, learn from, uh, and learn all the human dramas, which is why this you know, whole sense of we need many more, more voices and we need students, young theater people, to experience different voices and to expand their version of what humanity humanity can be. So when I had students work on fences, you know they were, you know they were in Australia. F so first of all, they didn't really know much about what August Wilson was writing about, and they had to learn about a totally different culture, and learn about different kinds of ways of, of uh, growing up, and ex hopefully learning more empathy. Uh, my only other connection, or another deep connection I have to cultural appropriation is I've, I've performed uh, Butoh for many years, Japanese Butoh. Uh, and uh, I won't get into it too much because I don't want to take up too much time, but it's about, um, you know, how can one dance another person's culture? If I am performing Butoh, am I actually appropriating and ripping off someone else's um, experience and culture? And the answer sometimes is yes, sometimes no. And I think the for me, the issue about cultural appropriation or cultural translation, or if it's like a blood transfusion, it's cu cultural transfusion, and you actually tra take someone, the, the, um, the blood and the tongue and the story of someone else, and you actually really go through a deep transfusion into your soul, into your heart, I think sometimes it can work. I think uh, there have been times when I performed Butoh in the past when I really wasn't digging deep enough and I was merely ripping off the signs and signifiers of someone else's story. And then I think when I went deeper with it, I actually made it my own story. So those are my connections. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Actually, along the same lines about, you know, working with uh, students, I, I need to share my little story because I'm in rehearsals right now at Ithaca College with a device theater piece about microaggressions and macroaggressions on college campuses. And after a whole semester, last semester of protests, you know, and the vote of no confidence uh, against the president of Ithaca College, I thought that we cannot do anything else. We cannot stage a play. I need to, to use my little workshop production slot to devise a project with the students. And we are featuring uh, 14 students. One of them is a spoken word poet, Jarel uh, Jerome. And uh, it's really important to learn from the students and to, to work together to shape this script and this uh, piece. And that was uh, my little thing of what I'm trying to do right now for with young people. Uh, but the other issue, you know, as I'm um, speaking about Romania now, wearing my other, my, my Romanian hat, uh, <laughs> because back in Romania I used to be a talk show host and I was having a TV talk show called Necessary Polemics. And I'm <laughs> really, now I'm realizing that I'm back with that hat on me. I'm like, I need polemics in my life. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why this panel. <laughs> so back to the issue of cultural appropriation, because with this panel, I really want to open it up to questions from the audiences. I think the most important thing that we can do is to have this kind of conversation. So I like to open it up to questions, if you guys don't mind. Yeah, Randy.
I couldn't hear a thing. Go into your work as more transcultural rather than cultural appropriation, given where you're from. And can you pass this microphone to whoever? <laughs> because so far it's anti-white, anti-this, anti-whatever, is, is what I'm hearing. But on the other hand, Kyung is like the personification of somebody who's writing work, at least in my mind, um, that's Chilean and uh, Korean and American. And so as a writer, how do you see your work building on your own culture? Please. OK, so I'll start. Um, so I think uh, I saw a great documentary last week. And I'll use it as an example to sort of explain what I do. Um, it was about Boyle Heights and the history of this community in LA that over the years, for the past, I don't know, 40, 50 decades, has, uh, has really changed in demographics with new influxes of immigrants, but really maintained this very strong sort of activist nature. And uh, you can see it, you know, sort of with the Japanese population taken to internment camps and shifting to this African American community, and from this African American community becoming a Jewish community, and from a Jewish community becoming this Latino community. I mean, identities are really permeable, and I feel like I carry many. And this country, because it's so racist, it just wants you to pick one. And you can't when you fit so many. So I just check multiple boxes. And part of the work I do, and what I love doing, is to just short circuit that thing that makes you just want to be one thing. Because it's so inhuman to try to do that. And I don't understand why these stereotypes are perpetuated in our culture, or why we need this. Um, so, so my point of attack is to just confuse you so much <laughs> that you just realize you don't know anything <laughs> because it is the only way there's some humility to talk about who we are. And, um, and, and it's been really hard to get to that point because most people just want to laugh it off and ignore you and dismiss you. So you really have to get on people's faces and short circuit their brains. So, you know, it, it's, you have to do both things. Great. Do you want an answer from Chris as well? Yes, I Chris? Do. Randy, is an answer. Yeah, well, I, I, I think that it, because I missed sort of the, the setup, I'm a little, I'm a little uh, uncertain on exactly the best way for me to answer. But um, you know, my, I, I probably gave the, <laughs> the wrong impression uh, by using the term fuck you before, because I don't think that I am anti, I don't think I write anti anything. I don't think I really know how to write anti. I think I know how to write my own stuff, my own experience. And my world is a very, very, um, uh, 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 Diverse, I guess, for the lack of a better term, world, you know, because of where I grew up and how I grew up. You know, like I said, in Puerto Rican, I grew up in the suburbs. I grew up on hip hop and professional wrestling, and and at the same time, theater and and you know, sort of like high culture, low culture. And you know, I think it, it, it's 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 funny, it, sort of hearing part of the question because what I had just written down here on my on this card right here <laughs> is advocacy advocacy for I don't know if you can see it, but advocacy for uh, as opposed to always against. And I think that there's this sense of like, for me, it's always about sort of what what are you, and, and this has changed as I've gotten older, but certainly um, the big question for me right now is what is it that you're, you're advocating for? What are you pushing for? Who are you speaking out on behalf on? Um, what groups are you giving body to? And to me, it's less about saying like I am anti, it's even less about saying like I am anti-white power structures because I work in white power structures. I work in those theaters. I work in these big, you know, mainstream theaters and I want to continue to work there. A, because it pays me better, but actually that's probably B. B, and A, because that's where I came of age. I grew up in the public theater and in Manhattan Theater Club and at the Roundabout and at Theater Works USA and in all these institutions and, and, and then regionally later on. So um, it's not so much to me about completely like dismantling or disregarding what all that is as much as it is campaigning for my own voice and for the voices of people you know who, whose work I did to be heard in, in sort of a similar way. I don't think that entirely speaks to that question, but. It um, does. It does. <laughs> that was my question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think actually that indeed we all have all kind of strategies to, to deal with these issues and bring nuances to the conversation. I was just talking last week with a Cuban scholar, and she was really upset that you know each time when like the Cinco de Mayo happens, she's being you know 
uh, uh, everybody tells her happy Cinco de Mayo and people <laughs> think that all the Latinos celebrate Cinco de Mayo and they don't even know what that is, you know? So I feel that we are, all of us, put in some sort of like stereotypical boxes and how do we get out of the, those boxes is actually my main question and we all have strategies. But questions from the audience. Um, so I came in on the tail end but I heard something that to me was very disturbing. Um, from the gentleman on the end with the checkered shirt. Yes, you. Um, it's a long story to tell about me and August Wilson. It, it, it's a funny story, but it's too long to tell. Um, but there was this time where this old man used to buy me dinner every night in a diner. I used to go to this diner every night, and this old man would buy me dinner. And he would, he was a writer. He would buy me dinner, and he would, he would say, he would talk to me, and I, I hated all of his plays. I said they had nothing to do with me. And he would read, read, read my, my poetry, my work, he said it's brilliant, but it will never sell. And you know, and this would go on, you know. And then one day, um, I, I saw a paper, and I saw a picture of this guy. And the headline said, August Wilson dead. <laughs> and I said, oh, stop, that was August Wilson, it's really funny. But anyway. The thing is, is all of these remakes, if you really want to reach people and do something, why don't you just produce a new play, a new coming of age story, instead of recouping all of this crap that people really don't really like, actually. You know, they want to teach like hip hop now. Who hate, everything's got to be taught in hip hop. It's a bunch of people who hate hip hop. You know, but now they want to make it like a school thing to teach hip hop, it's ridiculous. Just like when they want to teach Ebonics. If you really want to help, get a black voice, a Hispanic voice, that's not like a hip hop or whatever voice, that, 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 and, and produce it, something new. Isn't it strange? You want, you want to blame Scott Rudin, but it is a little strange that every movie that comes out is was a slave coming to be a slave, want to be a slave, the slave walk, the slave dance, go go, go out with a slave, adopt a slave, <laughs> the new day slave. I mean, you know, come on. There's no coming of age story. What do these kids do? They, 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 they put on chains and do a slave dance before they have sex and their first kiss? I don't think so. So forget all of that. Find something new that the people are saying. They came out with Afro punk. They used to beat us up. Everyone can Google now. The Ramones time. This is a video with me, the Harlem Boys Choir, filmed in the West 4th Street Church. One of the first videos ever made when they wouldn't let blacks on rock and roll out. They used to beat us up because we were punk. Now they come up with Afro punk 40 years later. Why didn't they just embrace us then? Embrace these kids now. Don't shove this shit down their throat. It sucked the first time. Thank you. Do you guys have some <laughs> comments or answers to that? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, I, I think oh, I. I, I, I uh, uh, I just wanted to clarify because I'm not sure if it was misunderstood when I said I worked had uh, my students work on that play. It was in class. It was never a production. Right. Uh, so, so I would never. For example, I think one of the issues that we were going to talk about was, um, you know, doing the mountaintop uh, with a white actor. I would never produce something like that. Uh, I was. It was a classroom experience. But I, I, I very much hear your story, and I. I Let them write something new in that Yeah, I support that as well. And get it produced. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, uh, hmm, I can't pretend to speak for every, uh, every theater in the country, nor um, pretend to tell you anything you don't already know about how it works. Uh, but one of, the, one of the challenges that I found sitting in those seats, working on new play development, and really advocating for new voices, um, and, and working to make space for a diversity of voices, or working to push against the obstacles so that we would have more inclusive spaces. One of the things that you encounter is a belief, and I don't think it's real, about what you can sell. Well, that's what August Wilson used to do. Yeah. Every day like, I don't thing, actually so this think is this thing is real, but Maybe it's right. it is power. It is a powerful narcotic. It's like nobody wants to see that, or I can't sell that. What I can sell is that thing that was already popular. 
What I can sell is that thing that has someone in it who is or was a already A black popular. man lo looking for a ham. And these are, these are powerful <laughs> obstacles. There's a thing that Kyung said, though, that um, I feel like each of us are talking in various ways about strategy, and there's a thing that Kyung said that I sort of want to underline, because it feels like a powerful gift. Uh, you used the words overwhelming whiteness. So it seems like a really powerful provocation to all of us to find those ways from where we are to overwhelm it, to just really push it out. Thank you. Uh, the lady with the hat. Hi, I just, I, I had a comment. Um, one of the things I thought that Christopher Diaz said that was really interesting was about, um, I think you said it, was about getting people of color in um, administration and in theaters because it's not that people aren't, there are no new voices. There are a ton of playwrights who are of color who are trying to get their shit done. And these theaters um, have a stereotype of their audience. That's what we sort of need to focus on as well. If you go to any of these theaters, um, and, and we're doing this play new playwrights initiative in, in LA, the Temblers, because when we, when we focus on LA theater right now, a lot of people, uh, they're bringing New York theater, play New York theater writers in to LA because they think that is a viable economic equation I, that translates into dollars. And we're a diverse group of people who are out there trying to prove that wrong. Theaters want to make money. They think their audience is white. If you go to a lot of these theaters in Broadway, $150 tickets, et cetera, yes, they are white because people of color don't spend $150 on said Huey, 55 minutes of Forrest Whitaker, which a great play, but who has that type of money? What we need to for focus theater. on, I think, also. Who has that type of money for theater? We'll for theater, exactly. But, what we need to sort of also focus on is audience development. How are you getting these young people into theater so that they see that as a viable career construct for themselves? Why do you want a kid who's 12 years old to go into theater when they can't even see ha themselves on stage? They can't see their stories and they don't know how they're going to pay their rent with it. So it's not just a matter of, it's the typical, it's, 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 it's changing the narrative of what theater is for us. And something the two of you both said in the middle about like, I don't know what the opposite of cultural appropriation is, it's theater, that's what it is. We're, we're all just doing theater. We just have to take away what we've been told, what that construct really is. It doesn't, it's not something that's put on us. We, a lot of us have different backgrounds. You were talking about like, the majority uh, uh, culture of going to museums, I, you know, I'm, obviously black too, and so um, a lot of my friends went to the museum, we went to the libraries, that's, we're, we're told that we don't do that. So that's not true, that's not a majority thing, and we're actually the majority people of color, it's not necessarily a minority of, of, of minorities, I hate that word, but we have to change how we, how we approach what we do and stop believing what people tell us is the construct that we operate in. Because we won't change theater if we, if we keep appro uh, approaching it in, di in this sort of traditional narrative. Yeah, can I, Seth, can I jump? Where are you? Yeah. I'm, here, I'm still here, same place. Um, look, okay, so for the people, people, for people of color, particularly young people of color who are out in the house today, well, let's, let's come over here, as, as Stephen Colbert would say. Come over to the camera two with me for a second. So you you belong in whatever space you find yourself in. Period, punto, like that's that's part one. Right? You belong in those spaces. You belong in those spaces as audience members, you belong in those spaces creators, you belong in those spaces administrators. If you go to those spaces, if you go to a theater, if you go to the opera, if you go to a, a to, to an art gallery, like you belong in those spaces. You're a shareholder, you have as much right to those spaces as anybody else does. So on that note, you have as much right to be participating in the conversation about what gets done in that space and what is art there as anybody else does. You may not have as big or as present a voice as people who've been, whose families have been doing it for 30 years, 40 years, multiple generations, but they need you. They need you in that space. If you care about the goddamn thing, they need you in that space. So don't be afraid, A, to advocate and make noise for the stuff that you want to see up on those space, on those stages. And B, maybe the most important, if you're a creator of art, like don't be afraid to make the thing that you can make that nobody else in the world can make. 
That's what, what Kiara Luis is doing. That's what Dominique Mariso is doing. That's what Lynn is doing. That's what McDalia is doing. That's what Lisa Moore is doing. I'm looking at you all now. That's what the people who are in this room with you are doing. And it's, 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 it sucks because it's hard to get produced and it's hard to get done. It's hard for everybody to get produced and it's hard for everybody to get done. It's hard for us. And it's doubly hard for you when you have you know, other sort of things in front of you. But like the thing that you can control most at, at the core of it all is to just keep making the goddamn work and keep making work that only you can really make. And you deserve to be in those spaces. I forget why I jumped in at this point. <laughs> 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 I have to make the fantastic work in addition to all these other sort of larger conversations. Make the work. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Actually, because we are approaching you know, our time limit, I'd like to give the chance to our panelists to give us a few closing remarks as panelists. That was mine, that was mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No closing remarks? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, so I've been thinking a lot about, you know, sort of cultural institutions as these like predominantly white spaces that now are becoming increasingly diversified and the need for these institutions to diversify because without those new audiences and those new artists, those institutions are gonna die. But I uh, look at sort of the power and privilege that exists within mainstream theaters or stages like Broadway, and I keep imagining neighborhoods that are becoming increasingly gentrified by people of color. And the thing I really fear is that people that are white are gonna get scared and fly away, white flight. And how do you create a neighborhood that is diverse, um, but is connected, and that doesn't lose the whiteness it has? Which is why I feel like we can't peg each other, and I, I don't mean to be anti-white when I say this, I'm just trying to understand how do we all become closer and more together and a real community that genuinely cares about each other's histories and not you know, become another urban space that becomes depleted when all the white people leave and then you're stuck. You know, in these narratives of people of color telling you, and now we've been abandoned by the whole system and there's no one here to help us, you know? It has to be a real collaborative effort. Um, and I struggle to find the metaphors to really say this. But um, yeah, that's all I wanted to do. Thank you, that was beautifully said. Um, yeah, I mean, you guys, I think I already said this earlier, it's just important to create spaces for telling our own stories. Um, and back to what Chris was just saying, you know, you guys who are sitting here tell your stories and I promise you, if you tell your story and it's specific and it's honest and it's truthful, you will find an audience for it. Don't let people, white people, <laughs> tell you that you know it's not going to sell or it's not nobody will relate to it. People will tell Black your people story. Will tell you it too. They will. They tell you. <coughs> that, that's what I'm saying. They beat the. But was the black people who beat us up when we came to them and said we were punk, and then they came out 40 years later saying they're punk, Afro punk. It, a lot of black people suppress black people. You know, I was talking to the one who runs the studio museum. I said, Miss, why don't you have any pictures of punk rock and stuff in the exhibition? She's got a little redhead white girl who's a curator of the studio museum running around telling people she knows what art is. But she lets the white kids do it, but she doesn't let her own black kids uh, show that type of work at the studio museum. And that needs to be addressed as well, to be fair in what he's saying. We're not here to beat up on white people unnecessarily. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I mean, how, what are you saying for that? Um, uh, um, one of the things I'll say to you, I mean, I already said the overwhelming whiteness thing, which will reverberate for me probably for the rest of my life. So thank you. <laughs> I thank you for that. Um, one of the things that I, that I focused on a lot in my work um, when I was inside the institutions and now outside, really focusing on audiences, is trying to, um, again, to make space and to, to promote inclusive spaces, but um, to do what I can from where I am. So to really recognize what is this position that I have, where, what space do I occupy, and what power is possible here. So think about where you are and what you can do from where you are. And for anyone in the room who's working inside an institution, get out of the building. <laughs> get out into the world. Get out into those conversations that are absolutely happening outside the building. Sure, they're happening inside, but they're happening outside too. 
Um, this was one of the things that we focused on a lot in Chicago at Victory Gardens. Um, we, there are a lot of things that we wanted for that theater, and a lot of those things are happening right now. But we had to get out of the building. The only way we were going to know about the Latino community or any other community in the city is to actually get out into that community. We had to get out and talk to and learn from and elevate and support and recognize. Thank you. Jeff, do you have a last oh, comment? No, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I, this is, I, I'm, I'm a, a no, student I'm here right now. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm learning uh, from all of you. That's why I'm taking so many notes. Uh, and my job is always to listen. And I feel privileged to have listened to such a great dialogue right now. Chris, do you have any last last comment? No, I'm good. I, I think yeah, just it's, it's, you know, it, there's benefit there's benefit to a lot of voices. You have to listen to all the voices that are in the room and you know keep keep making noise. Thank you, guys. Let's continue the conversation of our wine. <laughs> Yeah, for our life, I know. 